Welcome to Game Face, episode 196 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. I'm Shane Satterfield. I'm Matt Kyle. And we're here to bring you the biggest and the best in games from the last seven days. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, you can find Matt and I. I'm at Dinfire on Twitter. Matt is at M. Kyle. If you want to give us a follow, you can find Sifted at Sifted Games. If you like our content, you'd like to support us, head to patreon.com slash sifted. You can give us as much or as little a month as you'd like, and we'd really, really appreciate it. Matt, do you recall a January that has been this slow? No, this is a, this is a bit of a record. This I is think. a whole other level of nothing that we're dealing with here in January. Yeah. Uh, the good news is we have stuff like Fantasy Drafts, 2020 Preview mm-hmm. that help, help get you through. Usually by now, though... There's three or four games per episode for the last couple episodes of January. Not the case this mm-hmm. year, unfortunately. Well, you can uh, look around. We're not going to talk about it this week, but uh, the first indie darling of the year has has arrived, and that is the Red Strings Club. Um, you could do worse than check that one out. Yeah. Um, if you have nothing else to do, if you're not a Dragon Ball fan, there wasn't yeah. a whole lot this week. <laughs> and we'll be talking about Kakarot yeah. later on in the show. He will. I, yeah, <laughs> I jumped I on that grenade. <laughs> <laughs> not, doing, not doing that to myself right now. Yep. Uh, as I've been saying, uh, February is going to be a big month for Sifted. We're going to relaunch the site. We're going to launch... Oh, several... the hype train's early. Oh, wow. We're getting on the hype train already? <laughs> I love it. I love it. That was some of the most fun I've had on a stream in a long time last week. That was a great time. Let's see how high we can get the hype train this week. Let's see if we can actually get it to... Did we get past... Or two level three last we week? We got to level three. We yeah. didn't get through level three, though, I think right? we did. I think we did complete the height train oh. from what I saw. Oh. We are, you, at least people earned some emotes. Oh. Well, we did see that. That's for sure. Um, but anyway, we have big changes coming to Sifted. We're relaunching the site. Sifted 2.0 coming in February. We're launching several brand new shows that we're actually already producing behind the scenes right now. and will be ready for when we flip the switch. Lots of big stuff happening at Sifted right now. And uh, I appreciate that you guys are going to be along for the ride. Um... Let's kick things off with a fun topic. Hype! Hype! There it goes. <laughs> there goes good text. <laughs> it's great. Uh, we just Did we just hit level two? Level one Level complete. one complete. Yeah. We're at level two on the hype train. Uh, let's kick things <laughs> off with a fun topic. I mentioned last week when Matt and I did our very own fantasy draft that we were setting up an official fantasy contest for all you guys. And we did it. And it is ready to rock. In fact... Uh, very This very moment on Sifted.net, there is an article that will point you to the Sifted Fantasy Challenge for 2020. And I can show you the site right now. We got it loaded up. Um, so here's the article that explains the Fantasy Challenge. Obviously, I'm not going to read this because I'm going to explain to you guys exactly what it is. Uh, the Fantasy Challenge is a lot, a lot like what Matt and I do. You pick 10 games. Uh, the games are weighted, though. And actually, let me... Let me go back, and I'll just go to the actual Fantasy Challenge site so you guys can see it. Um, So you pick 10 games. The games are weighted, though. So your first pick is most important because I think there's like a two times multiplier on that. And then as every pick goes, the the (laughs) the multiplier goes down. So your 10th pick is weighted the least. So when you go to make your picks, make sure you pick the games that you really, really want to have on your team first. Um, Some rules to go over for this, though. Um, anybody can join. You don't You don't have to be a subscriber or a patron. The only requirement is that you do have to register and be a registered user of Sifted before you make your picks. So if you've never registered for Sifted, you're not a registered user, do that first. Go to sifted.net and become a part of the crew. After you do that, then you can become a part of the Fantasy Challenge. So like I said, you pick 10 games, any game, um, and it'll be interesting to watch what people pick because some people get pretty sly. In fact... The winner who won this challenge last year, I looked at his games. First of all, he had all 10 games. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's another thing. Just like Matt and I's league, if you pick a game that does not come out in 2020, you get a zero for that game. There are no alternates. So pick very, very carefully. Um, The other thing, too, is that while anybody can enter, and again, the requirement is you have to register and be a user of Sifted, the prize is different depending on who wins. So if one of our patrons or subscribers wins, they get two free games of their choice. If somebody who wins who is not contributing to our Patreon and is not a subscriber, they get one game. Now, somebody out there is like, oh, but if I win, then I'll just pledge for that month. No, no, no. That's not not going to work. You have to have pledged like basically all year. If you missed a month or two, we're going to be cool with that. But you have to have been someone who supported us 
all year long to get that second game. Uh, if you haven't, then you'll get one. I think that's fair. I want to hook up the mm-hmm. people who are helping us out, but I don't want to exclude anybody from the competition. Um, if you want to see how the scoring works, uh, on the Sifted Fantasy Challenge page, there are links to the last three years' results. And that's the crazy thing. This league has been going on for three years already in our forums and in our community. Uh, and this year, we decided to gussy up the page and uh, make it official. Um, but you can see the results. And actually, I'll click on one of these right now so you can see them. The site, the product does a great job of doing everything automatically. So you can see Bonio, the winner from last year. Congratulations, brother. Excellent work. Uh, but you can see it automatically goes into Metacritic mm-hmm. and grabs the scores and adds them up for you. And during the year, you can check back in on this page and it updates dynam- dynamically. So as games are reviewed, that score appears with your pick. I see um, he also got Bonioed by Anthem, like <laughs> I did. Yep. Um, so, and I think I ended up like 38th or something in this. Something like that. Yeah, I, I was 38th. I had Anthem, and then I had a bunch of games that were delayed because I picked a lot of the same games that were on my team when yep. I had against you. Um, but anyway, bookmark this page because you can come back here all year long and get an update. Uh, last year we had how many? Almost 90 players. This year, because we're promoting this officially, I think there's going to be a lot more. Um, so anyway, that is the Sifted Fantasy Challenge. Again, anyone can play, um, but you do need to be a member of Sifted to be a part of it. Um, and then again, the prizes are better if you're a subscriber or a patron than they would be if you're just a basic user. So there you go. Good luck to everybody. I have not even placed my bets yet. We can play, but we can't win. Mm -hmm. So we'll be in there with you guys, and you'll be able to watch our teams and see how we're doing. But ultimately, nobody who works with us will win it. It's going to be one of you guys. So good luck. Take your time on this. It's one entry per user. Um, That's another reason why it's tied to your user account on Sifted, so we know that you're just entering once. Um, So make it count. Uh, you (laughs) You get one team to start in this challenge. And uh, you guys are getting on this today. Obviously, when this show goes up on YouTube, there's going to be a whole new audience of people that's, that this is being exposed to. And then I think that's when we're going to see really the entries start to skyrocket. But it is up. It's pinned to the top of everybody's sift on Sifted right now. You Who's can't miss it. What's doing? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not listening anymore, but I'm just like, what the fuck is going on back there? It's been a long weekend. Yeah, Matt's had a tough go of it, man. He had some car troubles and some other stuff going on. Uh, but anyway, good luck to everybody. There are some other rules I guess I'll go over really quickly. Uh, ga- only games that are officially announced are eligible. You can't be like, hey, they're going to you know, show this, or this game's going to release at the end of the year. It hasn't been announced yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that on my team. You can't do that. It has to be announced. Um, there's no remakes. There's no remasters. There's no ports. There's no expansions. And there's no DLC. So you there's can't no dra- crying in baseball. <laughs> yeah, you can't draft any of that stuff. Also... There are tiebreakers, and I'll go back to the other page to show you guys the tiebreakers. Um, so chances are, because so many people are going to enter, there's probably going to be a handful of people that end up with the same score at the end, mm-hmm. because these are also all whole numbers. So chances are there's going to be people tied. So here's the tiebreakers. Uh, the highest individual game score is the first tiebreaker. I'm guessing all the winning teams are probably going to have that same game. Yeah, That's my guess. Um, the Which second I'm guessing is either Cyberpunk or Last of right, Us. Right, right. Uh, the second tiebreaker is the highest number of games with a score of 9.0 or mm. higher. Uh, the third tiebreak is the highest number of games with a score of 8.0 or higher. And again, if somebody doesn't win, we'll keep going down through this list. Uh, the fourth one, and I don't know why it says or two and the three. The second then. one. Yeah, or the second <laughs> part two, uh, is aggregate score of games released for one platform. So basically, if you have exclusives on your team, we would add up all the scores from the exclusives. And then the second, third one. Yeah, and if that doesn't settle it, the final tiebreaker is a live coin flip on Game Face. Hmm. It would be kind of awesome if it came to that. I don't think it will ever will. Um, and I set up these tiebreakers in the thought that it will not come to that. I don't want to have to flip a coin to decide who wins. So... There you go. That's the Sifted Fantasy Challenge for 2020. Again, I What if it's re- like a five-way tie? Do we just like keep flipping coins? Oh, if, that, <laughs> if there's still five people tied after all those tiebreakers, I may just give a game to everybody because oh, okay. the, the odds of that happening are like astronomical. Like, I really don't think that's going to happen. Or we'll we, could, we could fly them out here and have them fight to the death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my vote. We could start our own version of bum fights. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, that's the Sifted Fantasy Challenge for 2020. Everybody have fun doing it. It's going to be fun checking back in. We will probably reference take this. take their game face off. Yeah. 
We will probably reference this throughout the year on Game Face. We'll check in and see how people are doing. Although, as you know, the way this works is some teams may not have any games released until like the last few months of the year. Somebody may have all their games done by the end of March. It's just kind of how it works. So it's kind of hard to track. Although, if you're talking about everything has to be announced, probably closer to March. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because people will probably play it safe knowing Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So what's the entry deadline? Oh, thank you. The entry deadline is a week from today, January 28th. So by end of J on January 28th, you have to have filled out your bracket or you cannot be a part of the fun. So you have seven days. Get your research done. Get your list ready. Go in and make your picks. And good luck. All right. Let's move on to the first real topic, I guess, Mm. of Game Face 196. We're going to talk about delays again. We thought we had, like, the worst delay day ever, like a month and a half or two months ago. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> this, no you, had, you had to go and pick Cyberpunk, so. Yeah, this week is basically saying hold my beer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because if so. If you given me the first pick, then we would probably be playing Cyberpunk in April, I'm just saying. <laughs> it is uncanny, is it not, <laughs> that I picked Cyberpunk number one. And it was, what, 48 hours later? Yeah. It was delayed like 48 hours somewhere later. The, somewhere the, the Microsoft people in charge of Ori are just like, hmm. hmm. <laughs> Can we get Shane again? <laughs> so Cyberpunk 2077 has been delayed to September 17th. That's a pretty beefy delay. In four months. It's, and a little, it's not nothing. And a little disconcerting, to be perfectly honest with you, I as mean, someone who drafted the game. Right. I mean, I called this... A couple of times already. You said that it was going to be I delayed. I was pretty sure this was happening. But you, I think you said it was going to be delayed to summer, I guess right? it was more summer. I mean, this is only a month off of summer. Like, But I thought, like, if you're going to delay out of April, I mean, you're already past fiscal, so it's not like it super matters. But, like, I, I figured they want to be more in August just to get really far ahead of the next-gen stuff. Because uh, uh, otherwise, it's sort of, you sort of, I don't think it's going to hurt it, but it's just like people are, were kind of excited about this thing, get it a little earlier. Like, there's no possible way to kind of have people in that bracket where they're like, oh, maybe I'll wait and see if they do a next-gen version or kind of thing, or i got to save my money right now for a PS5 or kind of, you know, it's, it's just not as ideal, I think. But you gotta you got to finish the game. What so. are the chances now that it doesn't come out this year? Uh, I think close to zero. I, it's coming. I think it's coming this year. Are you concerned at all? It's too tempting to release the Cyberpunk 2020 game in 2020. <laughs> There's no way. they. It, 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 it had to be something very wrong. Are you concerned at all that after the announcement was made, CD Projekt Red came out and said, oh, we're still going to have to crunch? No, it's just how it works, really. Like, crunch is crunch. That makes me a little more nervous, though. The Doesn't. fact that every, every, every major game does that, whether you delay it or not. See, I just fit... When they announced a delay, I was like, oh, that's three months of polish. Mm, I mean, you're still crunching Which it when needs. you polish. Po- you'll still crunch when you polish. Yeah. I mean, that's how it works. It's, it it makes, shouldn't, it's not how it should work, but it is how all major game com- development studios work. It's making me nervous. I'll, I'll it just shouldn't. Put it, I'll just put it to you that it way. Should, it shouldn't. <laughs> it really shouldn't. Um, like, they all do that. Even Naughty Dog does that. Okay. And Naughty Dog does it more than they really I, should. I've just been burned so many times. that it I mean nervous me. in terms of it falling out. Of, yeah, yeah. Or, I don't, th- I like, don't personally, think Personally, so. I, I don't care. Like I just want them to take as long as they need with the game to make it as right. good as possible. Just selfishly with my fantasy league. I don't think, I don't think it will slip out of this year. That would that would greatly surprise me. It doesn't surprise me that it fell out of spring. It would shock me if it ended up in 2021. Yep. Like you, you want this Christmas sales. You want to ride the hype from the Keanu Reeves thing last year as much as you can. Like it's it's going to come. Is it going to be at E3 again? I mean, probably. Warner Brothers is handling yeah. it. So they might as well use that booth again. Right? I mean, it's going to win best of E3 three years in a row. Yeah. It's button up against like Half Life Two at this point. For best, most best of E3 awards. I mean, awards. C- certainly if I'm Warner Brothers, I'm, you know, probably, I would probably wouldn't have a whole new demo kind of thing, but I bet I would do something. You know, it, it, you've got the material, you've you've got the hype. You've you don't. It's not like Warner Brothers has a bunch of games you know, other than maybe the Batman game if they finally show that. Uh, you know, busting the door down. So I wouldn't wouldn't surprise me to see it there again. Yeah. Um. I, I think it has to be there. They be yeah. I think they'd be idiots to not take. It'd be it. weird to not have it there. I do wonder if it will win. I wonder if they'll try to bring Keanu back for something. I mean, they should. I mm-hmm. hate to say it, but they should. Unless they have another celebrity that they've been hiding. That's true. Yeah, it could be somebody else. Um, it definitely makes me nervous as as someone who drafted it in my league. I, personally, I don't care. I just want the game to be as good as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm cool with that. On the heels of that announcement, then they also announced CD Projekt Red that the multiplayer will not be coming until 2021. 
I know that a lot of people probably don't care about that at all. Most people are buying mm-hmm. this just to play the campaign. Totally get it. But it also shows that whatever they're working on right now to get this game done is serious business. If they've had to put the multiplayer on the back burner entirely to get the game done. Well, they said it's just it's it is optimization and playtesting. So like, and that's that is always all hands on deck, especially in a game as like open ended and open world yeah. like this. I the mean, permutations and com- combinations of what you have to test for this yeah. game—it's insane. It really is freaking insane. Like what they would have to test to make sure that the game doesn't break. So yeah, I doesn't wouldn't su- doesn't surprise me at all that even even polish and optimization isn't all hands on deck. We got a crunch for it thing with a game like this. Like maybe Madden doesn't have to do that, but like uh, this just you know it, you know and and anyone I mean Bethesda gets a lot of shit for this, but it's like so much stuff you're just never going to find out because your tester group is what 200 300 people and then when you put it in the hands of like 3 million people yeah you're going to find some stuff that no one in the testing group found like it's just how it's going to work yeah e3 will be interesting because it's going to mingle with the first generation of games Mm -hmm. for xbox series x and playstation 5 it may not win and and at one point you're going to have to like figure out like okay are you doing a next gen version of this thing or what like i think they definitely are they've already said they have no plans they're not doing it because they're trying to keep it they want people to buy buy it it early (laughs) yeah but i don't know you know it depends how it's going to roll and how the the next gen systems handle this stuff because i still believe that you're going to not buy a whole new disc or whole new copy you're going to maybe have to pay like like an upgrade fee. I mean, you could also thing. say that maybe CD Projekt Red right now has its its line in the water trying to fish up exclusive money from Sony mm-hmm. or Microsoft to That's have true. that next gen version on their time console exclusive. first. Little timed exclusive goodness. Yeah. You get you get three months Man, on if that. I, if I was Microsoft, I'd be like, come over here and oh, let's yeah. pay you for some Game Pass. Shit. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 on I the mean, table now. Imagine that. Like Xbox Series Series X, buy it day one. Game Pass subscription, Cyberpunk on next. Oh, it's gi- it would be Only gigantic. You can get it. It would be gigantic. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's opened up the doors for some. Microsoft has the pockets for it. It certainly so. does. Yeah, so something interesting could happen. What percentage would you put it at that the game's not going to make it this year? Ten percent? Zero. Zero. Almost. Really? I, I, it's coming this year. I think it's coming okay. this year. All right. Five percent. That's I'll what go, everyone wants to. I'll, I'll go to five percent chance of okay. falling out of this year, just because nothing's certain, but. I really don't think we're not going to see it this year. Okay. So the biggest game in the industry was delayed by several mm-hmm. months, but it wasn't alone. <laughs> oh, no. There are four other. <laughs> there's another game that weird people think is the biggest game in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. There's four other big games that were delayed all in the span of like two days, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is the Final Fantasy VII remake. It has been pushed to April 10th, which isn't a... I mean, days wise, is not a huge delay. No, but Although, fiscally, fiscally it's a big it matters because it slips out of fiscal, and also fiscally for a lot of people that I've seen that are excited for it had already scheduled those days off, right, to play to the- play it, <laughs> um, which I think is weird. Yeah. Because I was like, I mean, I understand taking days off to play a game you're excited about. Yeah, yeah, I've done it a bunch of times. But you've played this one before, yeah. technically. I don't know. I don't know if I trust Square to the degree that I would take time off to play a Square game. How nervous is this making you? I mean, because you got to realize it's a big deal because Square Enix knows, okay, we Mm -hmm. push this out, that quarter's done. It rolls into the next quarter Mm -hmm. financially. So you know this had to be a big deal for Square Enix. Yeah, this was not a small decision that they made. And so... To me, there has to be something pretty wrong with the game. Yeah, something needed to be fixed. really fixed. Yeah, fast because I mean it's, it's two months out. I know. You know it's making me nervous. They found they must have found something that they're like, okay, we gotta deal with this. And I w- yeah, like you say, it wouldn't surprise me to see it slip later in the quarter. I don't think it's gonna fall past Q two. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's coming out this year. Yeah, for sure. but I do think there's a non-zero chance that it falls to May. Yeah, or it so. goes further. Who knows? Look, also because of how like you, you know you, you plan your your you plan your things, you plan your revenue income and sort of thing for uh, for the year. Like they are def- they have definitely because of one of the other delays, they have a, they have a slot open where Avengers used to be that they could stick this. That's true. And shareholders are prepared for an influx at that point. That could be that could be a fallback option if they don't get whatever they're doing done in time for the April release. So I wouldn't take more time off just yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> I I, th- I think Final Fantasy VII. I don't think it's a huge possibility, but I'd give it like a 30, 40 percent chance of slipping to May. Yeah. Um, but it will it'll be out this yeah, year. Yeah, it's going to make it this it'll, year. This, this will not be at E3 again. I when do think. you th- It could. I mean, they might because they have nothing else to show. Yeah. But I think they'll be too busy trying to convince us Avengers is good. Yeah. What? So what percentage do you think that is that this doesn't make it? Zero percent. 
for this year. Zero. Yeah, this is this will be out this year. There's no way. Yeah. How long do you think it's going to be till we see the next chapter of this? That this is, is, don't forget, that is this is episodic. Choice. That is an excellent question. I look if if they're smart, and I'm not saying they are because they're square. <laughs> oh, if they're smart. They will not try to upgrade this thing as they go. They're not going to add new effects, make the graphics better, make the, all that. Shit. Just make more content. Yeah. Like lock the engine down, lock the graphics down, lock the character models down. Like lock everything down in terms of you know production and just Build. make the content yeah. and get it out there. Yeah. Like it's already weird enough that you're probably not going to finish this game on the same system you started. On. Oh yeah, I mean that's definitely um, not. Like happening. I'm sure they'll all be available for PS4, but like. Most people, I think, especially those who That's are interested be in Final those... Fantasy, are going to upgrade to PS5 before then, and they're going to play the PS5 versions. It's going to be one of those weird things, like a Wii U game being released right now, where you're like, oh, that's cute. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. It is. You're right. It is weird that a sequel is not going to appear on the same platform. It's I mean, not I think it that will. rare, but... I think it will be. I think you will be able to play all the remake episodes on PS4. Even if it's like five years from now, you yes, think? Yes. I think, I think they'll still make... I mean, there's people... Because it could be. There's people still making Vita versions of things. That's like, true. You can do it. Yeah. But I think, obviously, it will also be on the next-gen systems, and yeah. most people have moved on by then, and that's just sort of a weird... And say, I'm assuming save it'll carry over and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm that sure That stuff should be good. I think, I think the PS5 will support that kind of thing in general. It's not going to be a crazy thing they have to do. You're not going to need to transfer or anything. <laughs> uh, Matt already hinted at the next game we're going to talk about, and that's Marvel's Avengers. Mm -hmm. Slip to September 4th. One of my games I drafted. Another yeah. game I drafted, which I thought was just money in the bank mm -hmm. not necessarily a high metacritic score but coming out yeah. i thought it was money in the bank but now it's up near around q4 and it's the game has had troubles pretty yep. much all along i am going to say that i am not going to be surprised if this slips to 2021 i think that, i hate I think, to admit it but i agree with you i think they don't know what this is yet i, I don't think, know if i go that far but i think that they're scrambling I think they were caught off guard by the response to the game. Definitely. Def I, th I think they thought it was going to be... I mean, I, the presentation at E3 definitely felt like um, it had confidence to it. Like, it was, like they thought it was going to be awesome and amazing, and they had all this, like, extra stuff. And, like, you know, you had the dossier files they handed out and badges. Like, it was... like There was definitely a, uh, ha, we got the thing. We're good. The thing. And then, like... You know, they had a, a guy got up and does the whole speech about the amazing partnership with Marvel and da 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 da, da and like they weren't ready for the response. Uh, now the response to when the the gameplay was actually made public was obviously much better. Um, the, uh, the the press was kind of down on this game at E3. Yeah, it showed better at Comic Con um, and Gamescom. In part, I think because you know you just come off of Endgame two months earlier, and like yep. everyone was still high on how awesome all the MCU stuff was, and this does not look like the MCU of video games. It really doesn't. You know? And That's that, sort that of probably the is the root problem, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, like I and I just the other thing is like. We've seen so little beyond just what we saw in the demo is obviously the tutorial. You know, it's obviously the yeah. first thing you play. Mm -hmm. It introduces you to the whole thing, uh, teaches you how the different types of characters work. Um, what I think is going on here to some degree is I don't, you know, clearly they're trying to make like a, 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 a gas, a Destiny a Destiny yeah. style game. I don't think they fully figured out how that works yet. Like how how that how this game's gonna play that way? Where the multiplayer comes in? Where the solo stuff works? What you're collecting? What you're paying for? I mean, I think I think there's there's a lot. That's of a internal, lot to wrangle. I think there's a lot of internal debate over what this needs to be to to catch. To, you know, because you need it to hook. You need it to really pull people in. And I think they're still sort of shaky on that. And like you know, September isn't too crazy place, but you're 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 bumping up against cyberpunk now. Yep. Uh, which is going to take all the huge, hype away. A huge mistake. And if you push it too far, you're wandering into next gen territory, which is you're, you're, it's going to be hard to get some any signal through that noise. I think that's why it has the date it has. Yeah, and I think I think they looked at it and they're like, "This is where we need to right get it." Right now, out. I think, but I can c completely see them pu pushing it back to like February to get some space. I don't disagree with you at all. In fact, I would put the chances of it slipping to 2021 at probably around 40 percent. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree. 60, with that. 40, yeah. 60 percent it comes out yeah. this year. 40 percent it doesn't. Um, which sucks for my fantasy team, but <laughs> it's just the way it is. Um, when you see a release date that early in the year, you just think it's just set in stone. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> nope, 
That's not the way it's working with Marvel's Avengers. Yeah, especially like May, like May dates tend to be pretty rock solid I, yeah. in my experience because May is like exactly where you know you need to be. It's like right we're gonna E3. we're gonna have this done before E three. You know you don't like have to show it at the yeah, show. Exactly. Yep. It's there's a lot of stuff that goes into setting that date, but. That, again, that shows that there's something going on yep. with the game. And I wonder if they want another E3 presentation. <sighs> if they want to try it again and try to like win some goodwill back from the core gamers. Um, I guess it depends on where the game sits. Kind of the, the opposite of what Sony's doing. Right. But uh, Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, next up, Dying Light 2 delayed indefinitely. Mm-hmm. Um, Techland says it will provide a new launch window in a couple of months. Yeah, wel- welcome to the team, Watch Dogs <laughs> Legion. <laughs> yeah. You, so you drafted Dying Light 2. Yeah. I think I did mention during draft that that was your one pick that I was a little nervous about. Yeah. And I guess I was just for estimating, good reason. I was just estimating based on the time it's been and sort of how solid it looked last year that I thought maybe, you know, we probably are pretty pretty good shot at this year. Yeah. But uh, maybe not. I mean, indefinitely, we'll give you another window is definitely uh, a... That's not what you want to hear. If you drafted a game no, in your fantasy team, that's for sure. I mean, obviously, you know, take as long as you need to make it good. I'm very excited about this game just to play it. This and, game is very so, ambitious, for sure. Um, and, and I understand why you need to delay this, because, like, there's so much going on here. But, uh, yeah, not, uh, not encouraging. Nope. Um, but, yeah, like you, it's like you know, I didn't draft it, so I'm fully on the take as long as you need to get this game right train. Mm-hmm. Um, and again... The other window we had before this was last summer. So, I know. I mean, it's not like... Yeah, I mean, look, there's still a chance it comes out this year. It's not a done yeah. deal. Um, you know, maybe they just had something that they were, like, working on, and they're like, we don't really know yeah. how long it's going to take. And maybe they get it done earlier than they thought, and it still makes it this year. Mm-hmm. It's not a done deal. Be a good showcase for next-gen stuff. What percentage would you put on this game coming out in 2020? I think I'm going to give like 40%. Yeah, the flip of the last one. Yeah, 40% it it comes out this year, 60% it doesn't. Yeah. I agree with that as well. Uh, And then the final game that was delayed, again, this all happened in the span of like 48 hours. All these things were delayed. And the final one is Iron Man VR. It's been moved to May. Uh, This is a PlayStation VR exclusive, and I would argue probably the last big PlayStation VR exclusive. Um, even Golem came out. Did you realize that? Golem yeah, came I, out? I, I saw that. Have you played it? No. I haven't touched it either. After all that waiting, I still haven't given it a go. Uh, but this is kind of PlayStation VR swan song for PlayStation Station VR 4. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we're probably going to see PlayStation VR 2 before the end of the year, at least get a presentation of what it's going to be about. Um, I don't think it'll launch at the end of the year with PlayStation 5. I think that'll probably be for next fall. But mm-hmm. I think we'll know what it is and some rough details about it before the the, uh, year is up. Um, So this is kind of the last hurrah for PlayStation VR 1, um, and it's been pushed back to May. So I don't think anyone's going to shed any tears. I don't think anybody drafted this game on their fantasy team. No, this is very much a game where I'm like, Okay. This is gonna be like, oh, that comes out this week. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, and then I, you'll go, you'll pick it up and play it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not scheduling my year around this one or anything. I have a feeling a lot of people wish this game was coming to other HMDs. Yeah, I think uh, probably. Yeah, especially it would, it would benefit from better graphics. It, probably. it definitely would, and frame rates and all the other problems that come along with PlayStation VR, yeah. the screen door effect, and all that other. But jazz. one day it will run on PlayStation VR two, and it'll probably be and it'll better. be a stunner, absolutely. So there you go. Those are all the delays from the last time you saw us seven days ago, and in fact, they all happened. I think like the day after, yeah, and it was then fast. they just kept rolling for like two days. I it's like every day I woke up and I'm like, for real, another one. It's pretty crazy to see this many high profile games all delayed in a very short time frame, but. That's where we're at. We're in that transition period between generations. There's a lot to consider about releasing games right now. I mean, a lot more than if you had put it out last year or the year before, where you know what the platforms are and they're going to be there. Um, Now you don't know what's going to happen with PlayStation 5. You don't know what's going to happen with Xbox Series X. Um, Do you make your games, you know, what kind of backwards compatibility programs are they running? I'm sure they know by now. They've Mm -hmm. got that messaging from Sony and Microsoft. But then you have to... Action, make you know, be actionable on it. Then, if if you're like, okay, you're going to allow this, then we have to do the work to make sure that it works. So, there's a lot of stuff putting these game release dates in flux right now. Um, I'm hoping this is the last time we do a topic like this uh, for the year. <laughs> Narrator, it wasn't. It was yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know that little thing says three months later. Yeah. <laughs> you see in all the YouTube videos. Where does that come from? <laughs> it's hilarious. Mm-hmm. I laugh at it every time. Anyway. Uh, let's move on. We're going to talk next about Nintendo Switch. I think Nintendo Switch. Because um, there was a rumor this week, and it didn't really say 
that it was that the stuff is for Switch, but I'm just assuming that it is uh, yeah, because the 3DS be. is dead, yeah. essentially. Uh, it came out this week that a new Paper Mario and a new 2D Metroid are on the way. And Matt, again, you talked about a 2D mm-hmm. Metroid in our 2020 preview episode. Mm-hmm. You're, you're like a regular, like, I don't even know, you're like Miss Cleo. <laughs> You've been there. Uh, and I'm right sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Um, Paper Mario, the one that we're looking at right now, this is the uh, Wii U game. What was, it, what was it called? Paper Mario Paint something or other? Um, I don't remember. I don't know. Last one I remember is Sticker Star. Stick, yeah, that's it. Yes. That, that's what this is. Is that yeah. this? Yeah, that's what it is. Um, the rumor is that it's going old school. No, it's a color, color, color splash, splash or something. Yeah, yeah that's it. It still has, like, the sticker aesthetic in it, though, for some reason, like, shines. stamps and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know why they thought the sticker thing was, like, the, the key to the rest of the franchise here. <laughs> uh, Let it go. So the rumor is that the there new is. Paper Mario is going old school, back to its turn-based RPG roots. I'm very okay with that. I think everybody is very okay with that. I can't. I under, honestly can't understand why this franchise went astray. I don't know. That's why I basically switched to the Mario and Luigi series yeah. after a while, because like, that still had that kind of gameplay. It's not, not like Nintendo has a ton of turn-based RPG franchises. It has Pokemon. It has Fire Emblem. Mm-hmm. But, it's more of a strategy RPG than a normal RPG. And then Mario and Luigi, which is basically just a handheld only franchise, yeah. which Switch is a handheld, so I guess it still makes sense it's there. Still, I mean, I, I'd play another Mario and Luigi game, absolutely, yeah, yeah. on the Switch. But it's not like, you know, this isn't a genre that Nintendo has an abundance of releases in, so I'm surprised that they kind of went away for it for a couple mm-hmm. entries in this franchise. Uh, I think everybody wants this franchise to be a turn-based RPG, and I don't think people would even mind if they went back and remade, like, the original one. Yeah, I'd, I'd play a remake of Thousand Year Door. Absolutely. For sure. So th- I think that stuff's on the table as well. Although the rumors are that it is a new Paper Mario game. Another thing I should add too is we always try to tell you how reliable uh, this information is based upon sources. The source of this information has had insider Nintendo information like over ten times. Mm. Um, and again, we won't talk about this stuff on Game Face unless we feel pretty comfortable. Uh, that the sources are reliable, and in this case, it absolutely—I feel it absolutely is reliable. Um, and then a 2D Metroid, mm-hmm. also incoming for Switch. Um, something again that you mentioned in our 2020 preview that you thought might happen. Uh, you were talking about Mercury Steam mm-hmm. making it. Because um, it's about been about two years, and they uh, haven't done anything else. So. Yeah. And they did a really good job on Samus Returns, so why not? Yep. Do you think that they would release it for the 3DS as well? No. No? I think it's Switch all Switch exclusive? now. I think it's all Switch now. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen a 3DS game announced in, no. like, almost two years, I think. And I think uh, I think the rumor addressed this, but I think it would be a sequel to Fusion. I okay. I think it would be a, an actual continuation of, of the series, so Metroid 5. Yeah, the rumor did say that, actually, mm-hmm. that it would continue the story of Fusion. Did you like Fusion? I did like Fusion. Like, I I don't like... I didn't necessarily like kind of the guidedness of it and the introduction of uh, of kind of the Adam backstory was a little weird. And then, of course, I like it less now because Other M is garbage and Other M capitalizes on the Adam thing introduced in Fusion a lot. Yep. Um, but in terms of, like, what it did with Samus and, and sort of uh, how it changed things, I thought that was interesting. Um, I don't see any reason not to keep going with it. Uh, there's, there's still possibility there. Certainly better than rehashing over and over again. Um, Nintendo does ten, tend to get kind of stuck in uh, sort of these weird spaces where they don't want to move forward with things like that, especially narratively. But um, God knows Zelda has had that problem forever. Yeah. Yeah, for but sure. um, like I don't see any reason not to move, move forward. I mean, they were going to do it originally with Metroid Dread. Um, I'd like to see what they come up with. The, the long rumored Metroid as, Dread. As long as she's not running around screaming, for, for running from things like, like some kind of like, it's I just get. Well, I don't remember his name. The guy was it Sakamoto? Is it Sakamoto who, who runs this? The narrative on the he dealt with the because a lot of the characterization of Samus and other M comes from the manga that never came here. Uh, she, I don't know where don't she know. is more of a squealy little girl kind of thing. Um, 
not that. I, my Samus is uh, is this one or the one from Prime. I prefer that version. Yep. Uh, but as long as you do that and kind of leave other M in the dust, which they seem to have kind of quietly. Oh, they've done that already. Seem yeah, to have yeah, quietly yeah. like m- ignored other Brush M. Brush that, swept that forward. under the rug a little bit. Um, I'd like to see what Mercury Steam can do when sort of like let loose uh, and given the chance to kind of design their own Metroid scenario because you know obviously they're working from what Metroid Two had already established in this game. Um, yeah, being it. I mean, I think Mercury Steam has done a lot of good good stuff. Like they're, you know, uh, they did a even good, the 3D Castlevania. Yeah, they did a good job reinvent. <laughs> reinve- well, the second one wasn't good. Yeah, but they did a good job reinventing Castlevania for that first one. And uh, Mirror of Fate was probably better than it should have been. What and the the 3DS the 3- game? 3- 3DS yeah. one. Yeah, and, it was pretty uh, good, man. Especially yeah. technically. Like holy yeah. crap, what they pulled off on the 3DS that was yeah. impressive. I mean, Lord of, Lord of Shadows Two was weird, just in the sense of like you, you thought I wanted to sneak around as a mouse, huh? <laughs> like that was a, that was a thing you thought was worth spending your time on. Yeah. But uh, other than that, I think they have a really good track record, and I'd love to see what they do with Metroid. And if it's that, you know, I'll love them forever if they're the ones who get Metroid back on track for you know because it's my favorite Nintendo franchise, certainly pound for pound. So yeah, I hope I hope I'm right. I was I was very happy to see this rumor pop up. Yep, me too. Honestly, um, I think at this point I might be just as excited for a new 2D Metroid as I would be for Prime Four. Absolutely, yeah. especially now that we're starting to hear that Prime Four may be farming out some of its development. Did you mm-hmm. see that story? Yeah, that's I mean, discouraging. I mean, that's not uncommon. Uh, it is a little uncommon for Nintendo. Well, they did but... that with Metroid before, and it was mm-hmm. a disaster. Which Metroid? I think oh, the other, first other... one. First what? Oh. Well, this this Metroid Prime Four, they tried to farm oh, yeah. it out to another studio. Well, I mean, retro, retro. As long as retro is still in charge, like and and guiding things, they just have other people doing like, you know, basically grunt basically work. grunt work. Yeah. yeah, I think that's okay. Building levels based that's, that's upon not, how retro designs. Yeah, that's them. not super uncommon. Like, yeah, so I'm I'm okay with that. That's not going to be a, an issue. My my concern is just like, do you cap? Can you capture that lightning in a bottle again? That is Metroid Prime. Uh, all these years later, and with you know some of the team is still there, but a lot of the team isn't. You know, it's yeah. like, you know sometimes, sometimes series and g- games like that, especially when they all come out so close together, like Metroid Prime did. It was all kind of that same little span of yeah, years. Yeah. Like sometimes that is, in part at least, due to the crew you have. You know, it's like a Star Wars fan knows this. Like you know, the original Star Wars movies, actually the first two Star Wars movies were mainly due to the crew George Lucas surrounded him with. And once some of those people went away... You get Return of the Jedi. You end up with Return of the Jedi. (laughs) And then when all all those people go away, you end up with the prequels. You do, yeah. um, That is a problem. Yeah. And uh, and then when you have... uh, I mean, Rare is the perfect example. Yeah. I mean, there's no studio that, that shows this more than Rare where you're one of the premier studios in the entire industry... You lose your talent, and then all you have is your logo and your mm-hmm. URL at that point. Yeah, I like, mean it's like it's, it's like people they say that make these companies. It's like they say like you can't go home again because home isn't a place; it's a time. That's true. And so you know, however you hard you try, you may not be able to recapture that Metroid Prime magic again. I hope they do. Uh, I have some faith that they will. Especially the fact that they started over indicates to me that they know they have to. They know Nintendo seems to know that this thing needs to have that certain something, and it didn't. So they're going to try it and try and make sure that it does. Um, but because Retro of, hasn't released a new game in a long, long time. Long time. That's since Tropical Tropical Freeze. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, they've remade stuff. But that's but one of the reasons I'm a little like I was I, certainly I would say my my hype for a 2D Metroid from Mercury Steam uh, with no remake restrictions would be at least as high as mine for Metroid Prime Four. Not because I like it better than Prime, but because I have a little more faith. There's concerns there. Yeah. yeah. A little more faith in that than like recapturing Prime, in part because other, you know, indie studios have done Metroidvanias that I think captured Metroid sure. very well. Like it's, yep. you know, it's a it's a format we've grown up with and a format that a you know, whole generation of people, I think, know exactly what it needs to be between that and Castlevania. And um, I mean, you could hire. Prime is a harder nut to crack. I yeah. Think. I mean, let's be honest. You could hire 10 different studios to make a 2D Metroid. Yeah. I mean, you could go to these indie studios that have been making these games yeah. for the last you 10 years. You go get years. the Axiom Verge people. Yep. I mean, I'm glad they're making Axiom Verge 2 instead. Sure, I really, sure. I, re- I like to see them continue to do their own yeah, thing. Yeah. But, and I would say Axiom, Axiom Verge is the only indie met- at my Metroidvania that I think really comes close to giving Super Metroid a run for its money. It's that good. Yep. It really is that good. Yeah, and there's you know a handful of studios out there making games like that. Metroidvanias mm-hmm. that are really, really high quality. So I don't think... Hollow Knight's it, up there too, but I, I, yeah. the, Hollow Knight feels more Castlevania to me. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Uh, but Nintendo, you know, for 2D Metroid going forward, it has a plethora of studios it can work with. Uh, Metroid Prime, I think Nintendo found out, not so much. 
You know, mm-hmm. he tried to give it to Bandai Namco, uh, and that didn't work. And they had to bring it back to retro. So we'll see. What do you think the chances are of either of these coming out this year? Either um, Paper Mario or 2D Metroid. I mean, if they exist, I think the chances are pretty good. Yeah. Because uh, it feels like that's probably just like a later in the year thing we don't know about yet. Yeah. What has Intelligent Systems been doing? I know it worked obviously on uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses, mm-hmm. but it, I think that ended up being taken over by kind of another development yeah, studio. Yeah, that was most. That was, apparently Koei Tecmo did a lot on that. Yeah. Uh, down to the fact that Three Houses actually uses the same engine as Fire Emblem Warriors and Hyrule Warriors. Yeah, because Intelligent Systems bought, engine is so awful. Which I bought this week. Oh, really? Uh, Amazon had like a half-off thing for digital codes for uh, Hyrule, Warrior, Hyrule Warriors on Switch, which I didn't have, and I liked that game, so I got it and I played it a little bit. Yeah. I like. I, I really like Hyrule Warriors and Fire it's Emblem Warriors. It's a good Muso game. It's, it's fun, mindless nonsense, but like it's great. And the, some of the re, the kind of the epic remixes of the Zelda music is yeah. great. Yeah, it did a good job. Fun. All right, so there you go. New P- Paper Mario and a 2D Metroid coming for Switch. That's what's running through the rumor mills right now. We have no idea when they may or may not mm-hmm. come out. I would also um, really like. To, I would also really like to see the Metroid Prime trilogy come to Switch. Just. And that they could have farmed Frankly, out. Frankly, just to play them again. And that they could have farmed out to some other studio yeah. as well. Retro yeah. doesn't need to work on that. All right, let's yeah, you move. You just on. need to run that by ret- Retro once. Like, Does that look good? Yeah, sure, go. Yeah, I mean that's really all it is. Yeah. They'll have a liaison that maybe even embeds with the team or whatever. Yeah. To make sure it's all going good. All right, next up, we're going to update you on a ton, a ton of PlayStation Five stuff. Uh, it was a huge week for PlayStation Five. It news anyway. Um, it appears that Microsoft's unveiling of Xbox Series X has spurred Sony a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, however, maybe not in the direction we had hoped. Probably the biggest news item of the entire week is the fact that Sony is not returning to E3 in 2020. Did you ever dream that this would happen? Well, I mean, after last year... Yeah. I thought we like, talked about it after E3 last year, and we're like, there's yeah. no way that they'll do that with the launch of PlayStation 5 next year. I didn't think they would, but, like, as time as the year went on and, like, they showed less and less interest in even, like, talking to anybody, like, clearly they, they're, they've they turned over some new leaf of strategy over there. I don't fully understand what it is, and I don't fully disagree with the idea that they don't need E3. Um, I don't either. I just didn't think they'd be that bold. I didn't either. You know? That was really the thing. I was... You think about it, you're like, okay, this is how we've done things for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been 25 years now since PlayStation launched. It takes a lot of guts to launch a platform and not... Having all the success that you've had, it takes a lot of guts to launch a platform and do it differently from how you've always done it. Because Mm -hmm. it's just been... The way you've done it all along has been money in the bank every time. So to say we're going to do it differently and fly in the face of all the data that takes some balls. Yeah. I am sh- I'm I'm not shocked at this because it does or does it make sense. I'm shocked at the bravery that Sony is showing. I mean, this is a huge bet. This mm-hmm. is PlayStation 5. I I just can't believe that Sony came to that decision. And again, I don't think it's insane. I don't think it necessarily is going to hurt definitely not kill or even really hurt the playstation 5's chances no. it's just if you you are it, kind of in too big to fail territory with the playstation yeah i mean pretty much you could maybe you could stream it live on facebook with a cell phone and it would probably still sell out its launch a lot we'd find it that's yeah for sure. yeah i mean we'd find it still and maybe this is just a sign of the times this is just the way it is yeah. anymore it's do you need this stuff and microsoft's been gone you know like we said last week, if Microsoft, did, like I said last week, if Microsoft didn't have a theater across the street that it owned, they'd probably be gone too. Well, we should add that literally within hours of PlayStation announcing that it was mm-hmm. not going to E3, Phil Spencer said, oh, we are absolutely yeah. going to E3. Which, again, you're across the street from E3. Like You're, you're right, they, Matt, but you also have to remember that they do do a gigantic press conference. They do. I mean, they still, even though they are across the street. They still feel like they're there. Yeah. I mean, especially it, if you're only watching coverage. And I mean, let's be honest. To most people, all that matters is the press conference. Right. Like, people are pissed off that Nintendo doesn't do a press conference anymore. They don't care that they're still on the show floor. They're like, where the hell's the press conference that mm. I watched every year and got excited for? But it doesn't matter because it's not like you're not going to buy Metroid Prime 4 because right. they didn't show you in a press conference. It's like... Nintendo was really the first one to kind of wake up 
to this sort of thing. That yeah. You don't need the E3 spectacle necessarily to get your message across and get your stuff successfully, you know, in, in the zeitgeist. And so, I mean, Sony's obviously taking this to a new level here. Um, but if they pull it off, if, you know, if PlayStation 5 sells just as well as Xbox or better, which it probably will, um, or like you said, just sells out its allotment this fall around the world, um, I can't help but think that a lot of other companies are going to be looking at E3 like, what are we doing here anymore? I mean, that's what I'm wondering now. Like, looking at this footage, I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. Why does anybody do it? If, if Sony doesn't do it, why does anybody do it? I mean... It, look, now that E3 is starting to become a little more consumer focused, like it makes a little more sense because you're actually reaching your customers there now. But still, it doesn't make sense, really. Mm -hmm. Like, what is it? What's its purpose now? Uh, apparently, to let Fortnite fans run an <laughs> obstacle course. I guess. <laughs> like, I don't. I think. I think letting the public in was uh, was a was a decent short term like revenue booster. But I think a it. I think it demystified the the show. A it little did. Bit. That's um, a good way to put it, Matt. That is a so, really good way to put it, man. So I, th I think this the the mystique is gone, and uh, now it's just another convention, or it will be soon. It, I mean, it kind of is now. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're letting more people in that are just gamers than press. Mm -hmm. A lot more. Oh, yeah. They only let 2,000 press members into the show out like, of 60,000 60, people. 60,000 people, yeah. That's insane. Insane. But you know what? The ESA is paying the piper now for all its decisions. Everything it's done. Every time it's strong-armed. Hope, hope you're ready to see that Avengers booth again right, this year. Right, right. Every time it's strong-armed Sony or Microsoft or Nintendo or EA, all that stuff's coming back to bite them in the ass now. Because mm -hmm. you know those publishers were like, we're going to remember this. You know, when they went to the ESA yeah. and was like, hey, like. Because they're all paying that crazy yeah. fee to the ESA, too, just yeah. like Sony Like, was. when they went to the ESA at some point in the past and said, look, man, can you cut us a break on the booze? Like, this is insane. Like, we go to PAX and we spend, like, a tenth of the of the cost mm -hmm. for a booth that's twice the size. Like, you can't keep doing this. And the ESA is just like, nope, we've been doing it this way all along. We're going to keep doing it this way. You're going to keep giving us the money. Oh, no, we're not. Nope. Oh, no, we're not. I and mean, something, something similar happened with EA. Yeah. You know, they just didn't want to pay it anymore. Yeah. I mean, people people sometimes forget that companies and human beings have free will. Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes when people tell me to do stuff, I'm like, you can't make me do anything. And you, they, they're they taken aback. They're like, wait a minute. Oh, you're right. I can't make mm -hmm. you do anything. Like, my wife sometimes will be like, go do this. I'm like, no. <laughs> and she'll look at me and she'll be like, what? Like completely flabbergasted by it. I'm like, you can't make me do anything. What do you mean? No. I have free will to do what I want. And the funny part is now she started saying that to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's a perfect example of like. I how, learned it from watching you, exact, Dad. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, fair game. Yeah. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I can't tell you what to do. You're right. And that carries over into business. You can't. You may think you have all the leverage in the world. But at the end of the day, the person or the company can do whatever the hell it wants. And sure, it's going to have to deal with the repercussions of it, but it can still do whatever it wants. And ESA has learned a very, very hard lesson with this. I, with Sony gone for good, I mean, let's just be honest. Sony's gone for good. Yeah, if you're, never if you're not here to, for this, why no, would you ever come Sony's back again? Sony's never coming back to E3. If you're not going to be there for the launch of a new platform, you're never going to be there. No. You're never going to have a game or a peripheral or anything that you're going to think is big enough to go back when you didn't go there for PlayStation 5. Mm -hmm. They're done. They're gone. And now that that finality has hit, you're right. The dominoes could just start tumbling down. And this show could turn into a debacle in like 18 months' time. It's, you're right. I, th I've never heard someone put it that way. The E3 has been demystified. And I don't even know, know that it was necessarily that it's because they let the public in. I think it's been a slow process over a period of time mm -hmm. because of the media coverage of the show. Once it got to a point where you could have a cell phone that shot video, I think that's when it became demystified. It definitely started there, yeah. And like, uh just the fact that it, it was harder and harder to kind of control the message um, because that was one of the things I think the uh, publishers really liked about the old you know, pre-social media E3 was that not only did you have everyone in one place, not only could you kind of like see everything and, and talk to all the press in the same week and everybody kind of got the same experience and you didn't have to travel around the country or the world doing the press tour thing. You just had, you just had to bring it to LA and everybody did everything, all got it all done. And because of the nature of how you handed out footage or how you did the demos, 
and who you knew from the from the press because it was a fairly small world back then yeah. in the press. You could control what your message was going to be. You could control in a everything much stronger way. Yeah. And now you just got everybody running around with monopods and a, and a and a cell phone. And it's not just like oh I can't control what this is going to be, but it's also like how do you sift through it? How do you get get you know how do you separate the signal from the noise on this thing. You can't, really. You go to sift it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're here for. That's what we do. But it's just, it's it's so much. And it's so, like, I always wonder when I'm, like, on the floor these days and you see all these people, like, recording, like, you know, with their cell phone walkthrough or whatever and, and giving all, the, like, you know, doing, like, a monologue. And I'm just like, Why? Like, why are you doing that for, like, the 30 people or who are going to watch Some of them something? are 30 people. Some yeah. of them are 30 million people. Like, yeah. it's, you don't know. And that was the crazy thing at E3 this year. I was setting up for, like, our shots when we were doing our coverage on the floor. And I'm setting up, like, a camera with sticks and, like, a crazy – and then I just see dozens of people walking by me with a selfie stick in their cell phone. Mm-hmm. And the crazy part is their footage, because technology is so advanced, still looks great. So – You know, just the ease of doing it, the fact that the barrier has been broken as far as, like, the cost of equipment and stuff like that, that used to be a huge barrier. When I started Mm -hmm. at Game Trailers, to do HD video capture, you had to carry around a scan converter, which is a piece of equipment that literally weighs, like, 55 pounds. And we had a Pelican case that was the size of, like, a car that we would haul around all over the world. You used to carry that cart around almost the size of this table. Yeah, and now you got a a cell phone that shoots 4K, 60 frames a second. I mean, I remember back when we and Vic Vic Lucas were the only people on the floor with cameras. Yep, yeah. And it's just all, like, you can access E3 now from, like, literally, Mm -hmm. like, a million portals. It used to be you had, like, ten portals to choose from. And to be fair, Vic Lucas is still out there on the floor (laughs) with that camera. Dude is. is. Dude is indefatigable yeah yeah much love for victor lucas from from this podcast that's for yeah. damn sure uh so yeah it's it's insane i never even last year i never would have dreamed that this would happen never and if you talk to me five years ago i'd say hell no you talk to me 10 years ago i'd say you need to be like committed like that's well, the idea, never gonna the idea that e3 would lose its relevance as much as it did in, in the last decade is was i don't think anyone would have predicted that except maybe, maybe pactor i don't know <laughs> Like that would have been some. That is probably something Pactor would have said, and everyone would be like, "He's crazy." And, and they'll start going and looking through the foot. It's like when he said Nintendo will sell cardboard and get rich from it, right? And people thought he was nuts. And then, they and then the Labo comes did. out. Yeah, <laughs> poor Pactor, man. He gets no love. He. It's funny. He just won like this award for being like the most accurate entertainment mm-hmm. analyst. And, like, still, like, he just, like, retweeted, like, a recent episode for his 2020 predictions. And, like, half of the comments were like, well, whatever he says, the opposite's going to be true. Like, I feel so bad for him, man. Like, I feel like there's, I can't stand up for him enough. Yeah, but I feel like there's kind of a Jack Sparrow thing going on there where it's just like, you're the worst pirate I've ever, like, I've ever heard of, but you have heard of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There is a little bit of that going on for sure. I just love the guy, and I hate seeing people be uh, irrationally mean to him. I mean, his job is basically. I mean, his job is not that. His job is to be an analyst. But yeah. I think he at least must partially enjoy kind of the the hate the haters, and then I and think, then proving them wrong. Just I like think sitting now back and that he's for, gotten over it, yeah, I think yeah. there's a certain element of it. Like, well, you care what I think. I think yeah. there's a part of that to it, but. You know, I think he's also getting to the point in his life where he doesn't want to deal with bullshit anymore. Oh, yeah. I think I'm already there, so I can't even imagine where he is at this point. I've been there for quite some I time. I have, too. So, I mean, Pactor has definitely reached that point. He just yeah. doesn't engage with him anymore. Like, years past, he would go back and be like, well, let me show you all the stuff that I did do right, and it doesn't matter. Like, that's no. just the way the internet is. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, who's right and who's – it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> who's also, right and who's wrong depends on who you're watching. It's also, like we're we're not we're not in a really great time period for facts right now. No, I you're right. You've noticed. Well, it's like today, kind of funny. Did their draft? Did a fantasy mm-hmm. draft? And uh, like people, like they tweeted it, and then somebody went at me and was like, "Everyone's trying to be Denfire now." Blah blah blah. And it's like I, I can't even. I'm not mad at them. Like it's flattering that mm-hmm. they're doing that and everything. But like if you look at the tweet, the comments in the tweet are all genius most creative thing i've seen in games media in years and as somebody who came up with that idea first and did it first six years ago it's hard to look at it's like man like these guys don't need it 
Like, they're already making, like, more money than they could ever spend. And, like, when you come up with something that's cool and, like, you're struggling, like, you'd like to get a little something out of it. It's that's, hard, man. That's, like, must be how the guys who made Kill Switch feel when they look at gears. Yeah, I mean, seriously. It's kind of the same same thing in a lot of ways. Although, you know, I mean, uh, Cliff does give them credit. He, he will yeah, mention that oh, all yeah, the time. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but yeah. you know, I don't know, honestly. I didn't get to watch the episode. I don't know if Kind of Funny gave us credit for it. I, I'm guessing probably not. I would guess not. They know that we did it first, though, because back when we did, like, the second season or whatever, they talked about it on their show. And to their credit, they did give us props for it back then, so maybe that's mm-hmm. good enough. I don't know. It just seems like it's blowing up now, and because people don't know us, anybody who does it, they're like, you're a genius. You've come up with this genius idea. It's like, no, bro. Like, Google it. We've been doing it for six years. Anyway. Um, next big, we have like eight huge PlayStation stories. It's been a gigantic week. Next up, The Last of Us Part 2 could be coming to PC. Mm-hmm. Again, reliable source. As always, we, we won't talk about stuff on this show unless we've kind of vetted it and looked at it and feel like we're comfortable with the story. Um, this coming on the heels of the fact that Kotaku just basically confirmed that Horizon Zero Dawn is coming to PC. Mm-hmm. Um... And I think once you know that, I think The Last of Us Part Two coming to PC is just like a done deal. Well, I don't think that's true, but you don't think it coming um, to P- you don't think it's going to come to PC. I don't think it's a done deal because I think the reason Horizon's coming to PC is because the Death Stranding project got Decima on PC. Oh, okay, same engine. If they're putting Last of Us Part Two on PC, that's a very because to me Horizon doesn't indicate like a sea change in Sony's strategy for putting things on PC. Last of Us Two getting a PC version does. Um, so Last of Us 2 getting a PC version would be a bigger story to me. No, oh, for sure. Um, I mean, just the fact that it, I mean... And I'm, they are going off, like, the, some of the, the hires they're doing right now with, like, PC this, a couple of... An NVIDIA, I think an NVIDIA expert they're looking for or something. And, like, you know, like someone said, either they are... Either that is PC-related or the PS5 hardware structure is different than we think it is. Um, it could be kind of either thing. Uh, but, you know, it's... I am not one of the weirdos who thinks exclusive should stay exclusive forever, and you yeah, can't play, you can't play my Sony game if you don't have a Sony. Con- they want to put like I don't care exclusi- at all. They want to put their exclusives out on PC like six months later or a year later. I'm probably gonna double dip on Horizon. I love that game, and, I, and I, if I get a better video card later that would make it look better than it does on the PlayStation, yeah, I'd probably play it again. Like that's what, great. What do you think is the right time, the amount of time after it's released on a PlayStation platform to come to PC? Horizon's obviously way in the green mm-hmm. zone at this point. I think a year is a yeah, pretty good space. I think so, too. At but, le- I think at least a year. Yeah. But, like, uh, you know, if, if they were going to put out a PC version of Last of Us 2 at the same time as PS5, that would be interesting because it would probably be the same thing as the version of P- on PS5. Yeah. Or if that's purely what they're doing here, that could be that could be it, too. Yeah, it um, all depends on the architecture of PlayStation 5. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't it's know It's really yet. hard to say. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, I think in terms of like spacing it out for letting the, the console version sell properly, you probably want to wait a year. Um, obviously, the more consumer friendly version would be to do it both at the same time. But uh, well, I don't know about that because consumer friendly, I think, in this case, is rewarding the people at least a little bit who bought your platform. Right, but um, I don't know. I, I feel like you are kind of in a space these days. Maybe not this early in a place in the PlayStation 5's life, but like certainly if you were talking about PlayStation 4 exclusives, if you don't have a PS4 by now, yeah, and you're playing everything on a high-end PC, they're probably not going to get you. Like if, yeah. if Bloodborne didn't play in, yeah, that was probably your 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 biggest. That was your. Weapon. That was the one you had to get over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's that's what a lot of people are like really excited about or, or wondering about is like if they turn over this PC leaf, are we going to get a Bloodborne PC? Uh, um, I mean, there's tons not. of money on the table for Sony. It's just sitting there waiting it for people to be. give it to them. Depends on how how easy it would be to port. Um, yeah. It depends how whether From Software has the bandwidth and whether you trust you know third party to do it. Um, but it isn't. I mean, look. My instinct is to think that like Sony wouldn't embrace PC stuff quite so readily, but it's not like they haven't already surprised us with not going to E3, and so who knows? Like they might be just completely rethinking what they're doing over there right now, yeah. and putting exclusives on PC after some time on their their brand console could be part of it. Yep, I think it makes too much sense. 
and therefore I think it's absolutely going to happen because <laughs> it just makes too much sense. And I would say a if year... I was like Naughty Dog, I would also kind of be in favor of it just in yeah. the sense like you could make your game look even better on PC. So. And you, you, you're you exposed to a new audience, a whole new group of people that haven't been playing your game. So I think it's a win-win, but the timing is important, and I think it leads, needs at least a year, at least. Mm-hmm. And I think... My guess is... And when it does come out after that time, it should include all the DLC. Sure. It should, it should oh, be like yeah. a Game of it's the like Year It's like the edition. Ultimate game of, yeah. Yeah, game of the Year version or whatever. But I, I honestly think Sony may end up leaning towards like 18 months mm-hmm. and play it on the safe side. Because the year sounds good to us I mean, look, as consumers, getting, but... But like, look, getting it at all, yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's all good. All gravy. Um, PlayStation 5 controllers. More information on that this week. Um... PlayStation 5 controller is going to be backwards compatible with PlayStation 4. Um, that's not that's a, interesting. Yeah, that's not a gimme. I mean, that's no. just not assumed that that's going to work. I mean, I like that. Yeah, I do too. Especially if you can switch between them on the fly. It means I can keep them both hooked up, but I don't have to that's switch true. my controller. That's true. That's a good point. Um, so, yeah, PlayStation 5 is going to work with PlayStation 4. It also has a microphone built into the controller, which now I'm like, why hasn't it been this way all along? <laughs> like, why hasn't every controller had a microphone built into it? It just seems like a no-brainer. Instead of, like, selling or packing in those crappy earbud things. Well, I think you're still going to want to use a, a headset. Yeah. But like, You're going to need to be able to hear the game. That's, I, I imagine that's going to be more of a uh, feature. I, like, tell the PlayStation what to do, kind of almost a, a mini Kinect idea. Oh, you think? That's like an I, Alexa type yeah, thing? Yeah, that's what I think that's for. Interesting. So you think there's, like, voice activation yes. of some kind on PlayStation. Yes. Um, I'm guessing there's software they can just license instead of having to develop that stuff themselves. Yeah, or, I mean, they have, they have the bandwidth to do that. Could be part, yeah. just part of the... Oh, oh. whoops. <laughs> Could be just part of the OS. That's true. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's possible. Uh, I will probably turn that off. I don't like my things listening to me like that. But. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Like, I, you know, your cell phone is absolutely listening to you. So mm-hmm. Matt and I, last week... Well, I turned all that stuff off. Was that off. last week or the that week That was before? last week. It was last week. Yeah. So Matt and I, before Game Face started last week, we were talking about sugar addiction and how it's hard to stop eating sugar. Matt has stopped eating sugar, and he's, like, taking better care of himself. I'm not. <laughs> but Matt is. We were talking about how hard it is to stop eating sugar and how it's really kind of like an addictive drug. Mm-hmm. So... Show open starts, show starts, we finish the show, we leave. I wrap up my stuff, I drive home, I go and sit down, I'm starting to render the show, I look down, and there is an ad on my cell phone to beat sugar addiction. Mm-hmm. Yep. It is, they're all listening. And so, you're right, to some people, having a microphone on that mm-hmm. console controller may be something they don't want. Yeah. I mean, I have my PC, my phone pretty locked down on stuff like that, but I have been, like, I remember once I was in an, working in an office with a very small space. We had a show team, like, crammed into a tiny little space. Like, like we had a little desk like this, and then we were literally back-to-back with the rest of the team, and our chairs would hit each other. Ugh. And at one point, we were talk, just talking about how, like, um, you know, we want more space, and, they're, like, the management was thinking about bringing in... Um, you know, another team for to do a, another show, and we're like, where the hell are they going to put those? We're going to need more space. We're not going to do that. Like, yeah, crazy. And uh, I turn around and refresh my Facebook feed, and an ad pops up on my laptop. It says, uh, looking for office space in Los Angeles? Yeah. And I'm like, bro. Oh, yeah. I've like, had that stuff happen. And I, I mean, that would not have been my stuff. It would have been because I'm on the network. That, that Obviously, everybody's on the network, and you're getting kind of the feedback on that. And then, like, everybody else is like, yeah, it adds over here, too. So, I mean... That happened to me with a bowling alley. A lot of times... I was driving down Venice Boulevard. I'm like, Bolero. It's two blocks from where we live. Why do we never go there? And Michelle's mm-hmm. like, I don't know. We just don't really bowl anymore. I get home. I go on Facebook. Bolero ads. Mm-hmm. Not just bowling <laughs> ads. Bolero ads in my Facebook. Like it's a scary. Lot of, like, a lot of times, like, you know, I'm sure, like, you know, people say, oh, it's not necessarily, necessarily listening, but it does piece together stuff from your habits and things. That's true a lot. But there have been a couple times oh. where I'm like, there is no other No, they're absolutely listening. Absolutely. That. So I can see where some people may be reluctant to have that on the controller. I'm assuming... I keep getting free Alexas and, like, Google Home things. I just give them away to people. <laughs> yeah. So you you want a spy, spy device? Yeah, there you go. It. Like, I don't want it. I don't need it. Uh, I'm assuming PlayStation will have, like, privacy settings for the mic. Yeah, you have to. Whether it actually works or not, who knows? You don't know. <laughs> mm. uh, the third new piece of information about the DualShock 5, which, by the way, it's now been confirmed that's what it's called, is a new type of rumble. Where do they come up with these names? Yeah, no. <laughs> is a new. There's some kind of new tactile feedback rumble that's going to be mm-hmm. built into it. Probably which, similar to like the Switch's HD rumble. That's thing my guess. Yeah, um, which is good. 
Um, I mean, one thing I would say is the the rumble in the Xbox One controller is far better than the force feedback on the DualShock 4. Yes. Far better. Yeah. Like, it just... And the Elite is even better. Yeah. You really notice it with, like, driving games and things like that. Mm-hmm. When you're driving on different surfaces, you can really feel it in your hands. Yeah. On Although, every once in a while, the Elite, if, if something really strong happens on the Elite, it bu- the buzzing is very loud and it wakes... Oh, the, you can hear it? Yeah, it wakes the cat up. Really? Like, it's yeah. audible. Like, it, like, you can hear the motor going. Oh, out. interesting. Like, I... On mine, at least. I take off my wedding ring when I play games hmm. because when it rumbles, it rattles oh, off my, yeah. my oh, wedding your, ring. Oh, your Elite would make an amazing sound <laughs> on that. <laughs> I don't even yeah. Want to hear. yeah, well, my wife's already asleep and I'm up playing games. I take yeah. the ring <laughs> off and put it over on the counter for sure. Uh, let's see what else. It just keeps on going. Um, Marvel Spider-Man 2. Are you going to skip Godfall? Well, we have that later. Mm. Yeah. Um, Marvel Spider-Man 2 leaked. It's coming. Yeah. I mean, it's not really a leak. Like, we no, all I mean, knew. Like it's been, <laughs> rumors have been flying around a lot about, about it. Like, I knew that a couple people were working on stuff for it. Like, it's it's in process. I mean, it would be they'd be idiots be not crazy. to make a sequel. Yeah. It sold amazingly well. It rated extremely well. It was one Especially of Especially if you're, like, having, you know, if Marvel's, you know, looking at what's happening with Avengers. Like, could you, could you, please, <laughs> could you please just make another one of those really good Spider-Man <laughs> games? That would, be, that would be swell. I mean, the year it came out, it was either your game of the year or your runner-up. Yep. I mean... Pretty much that's how it went the year yeah. that it came I out. I mean, it was I. This was one of the harder game of the year decisions. Here was between this and God of War. For right? me too, and I'm not even as big a comic book or Spider Man guy as you mm. are. And, and in the end, I went me. with God of War. But uh, this is this game's it was amazing. Worthy. Sometimes I I load it up just to see it again and just to swing around for a while. Yeah, but I haven't booted it up again since I finished it. Actually, I should maybe. I load it up pretty often if people are like over and they haven't been over before because this thing on my 4K and surround <laughs> setup is mind blowing. Like it just it's such a good looking game. Yep. Even if you've already played it in like on like a normal 1080p set. That seeing this thing in full HD is crazy. And surround sound. And, yeah. The audio in this game is amazing. It's great. Just as good as the visuals. Uh, so I think nobody's surprised that a second one's coming. There were some details supplied as well, though, mm. which is the game is making strides towards the MCU. Or they're going to address the, the larger universe, MCU? Marvel Universe as, as a whole. Yeah. So what do you think that means, Matt? It means they're probably going to get some cameos from non-Spider-Man characters. That's what I thought. Um, it's not going to be MCU, but it will probably be... Um, you know, you'll see maybe uh, Doctor Strange or yeah. Nick Fury or kind of things like that. Yeah, because the first game, the first game referenced a lot because like you could go to Doctor Strange's Sanctum and yep. and you could see uh, you know the Avengers Tower. Like, there were a lot of references, but they were all conveniently out of town, <laughs> um, which happens a lot in Spider-Man stories uh-huh. in general. Yep. Um, no reference to Fantastic Four. Uh, I bet you will see some Fantastic Four reference in this now that they have the license back. Oh, um, they got to start getting people excited about it again. They're, gonna, they're probably going to be a Fantastic Four movie coming up in the next ten years for sure. But um, hopefully, it's better than the old ones. It will be. Um, they're, apparently, the Russos, the Russo brothers, who did you know Civil War, Infinity War, you know all the good ones. Yeah. Uh, they said that the only thing they consider coming back for is Fantastic Four. Oh, interesting. So if you want to have, give the Russos Fantastic Four, you have my attention. Yep. But yeah, I think I think will, you'll just see more cameos. I mean, you'll probably see Daredevil, I would think, yeah. would be in this. Or the Daredevil's a separate license. But I feel like, because um, I, I know people who worked on the, the old Spider-Man games at Activision, and that was like part of the problem. Like There was a whole thing where... Um, you got to pay had, for each one, right? I had some really interesting conversations because I ran into the guy who ran one of the studios that made those games at uh, Pactor's Party, and uh, he's still mad. <laughs> he's still mad that some of that shit got shut down, uh, which I liked because I loved the, the, uh, some of those games. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think they, everybody did. And uh, But apparently, like, in, like, Web of Shadows, Wolverine's in that. And apparently, Wolverine was originally supposed to be Daredevil. Oh. But Daredevil is a completely separate Licensing license for some problems. reason. Interesting. So they, so they just switched it to, to Wolverine. But I would love to see Daredevil and Spider-Man team up for the for the first time in, like, a long time, I think, in a video game. Because they have a really interesting... I don't know if I ever remember them. I don't know that. if they have. I, I, I didn't want to commit to that because I can't remember yeah. every Spider-Man I game. Ne- I don't remember it ever happening. But I, I, Daredevil and Spider-Man have always had a kind of a, a fun little friendship. They should be bros. And uh, they were. In and like, games, I mean. There was always kind of a thing when, you know, the old, certainly the old 70s comics, like the Marvel team-ups where he, Daredevil would appear and they, they'd team up. And, like, you know, like Daredevil thought Spider-Man's a little too happy-go-lucky, a little too, a little too cavalier. And, and Spider-Man thinks Daredevil's too serious and maybe a little too violent sometimes. But, like... They get along and they're all on the right, the same side. There's a lot of there's some fun banter and dynamics there. Also, clearly, there's going to be Venom. Yep. Um, 
both because the the end of the first game teases some of that, and because uh, the Venom movie inexplic- it's gonna inexplicably <laughs> did so well. Yeah. And now we're getting another Venom movie, so there's definitely going to be some Venom going on. Yep. And they're saying release in 2021, which I think mm-hmm. also makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. We'll rewrite alongside uh, Q4 first year Q4? Of PlayStation yeah. Five. Hmm. Kaboom. Kaboom. That'd be uh, a, a good, really good second holiday for them. Absolutely. Um, okay, and then the final piece of the PlayStation puzzle. I told you guys there was tons of PlayStation news this week. The final piece of that puzzle is the biggest surprise to me of them all, and that is that there's a sequel coming to The Order 1886. Mm. You surprised by that? I mean, a little bit, because you would have, you would think if there, that was going to happen, it would have happened already. Yeah, like it um, should be done now. Like it should be coming out like yeah. this year. But... Uh, I mean, yeah, it, I didn't like this game very much, but I liked what it was after. You know what I mean? I like, like the aesthetic like of the, aesthetic, the game. the aesthetic. I like the concept, but it felt like... It sucked to play. It was, I mean, it was only like five hours long. And, that, and, and it when you finished it, it felt like you'd finished a prologue. Yeah. You know, like, felt, the, okay, the game's going to start now, yeah, right? Yeah. Nope. Felt, <laughs> like, if you cut to a title and like then the rest of the game happened, it would have made, made sense. Made sense. <laughs> like, like, they just kind of finished setting up the world and what everything was, and then you finally saw the werewolf stuff and all that kind of happened, and then, like, it was over. I'll um, say this. They they definitely learned some hard lessons from the first release. Uh, and I would assume that they would apply those to a sequel. Mm-hmm. And like you, and I, I did do like, hope, I like the idea. I like yeah. the concept. I like the setting. And I hope they'd get another shot at it. Yeah. Because I think there's a good thing in here. There's opportunity yeah. for something really good. Absolutely. Um, and maybe they can, you know, a lot of times the second game is the one that kind of nails it. Spider-Man yeah. 2. We were just talking about mm-hmm. Spider-Man 2 finally really nailed it. So I don't want to just Although, write it don't, off. Don't go back and play Spider-Man 2. No, not uh, now. Again. Yeah. That, that's not what you remember it being. <laughs> what games are? Very few games Very few. you can go back and play them, and you're like, oh, this is just like I remembered it. Very few, but but especially the licensed Activision games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I look, it's, it's another IP for the PlayStation 5 quiver, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. Like, we should have got another game from this studio already. It's ready at dawn. Yeah. But what, what else? Did they, did they do nothing after this? I don't think so. I can look real quick. Yeah. But I, I don't believe so. That's the last game I remember them working on like i don't know I, th- I thought they were working on i remember seeing stuff from them i don't know if whatever they were doing ever came out again well let's ever find managed out. to make it out this is another cool feature ready at, sifted you ready can look done up. new game all right oh, okay yeah that's all the, well i think we may have just added that um the order god of war origins deformers lone echo oh deformers i remember yeah yeah Yes, something else we do on sifted that you can't do anywhere else you can search for developers and publishers and you can see everything they ever created Use the site, people. Hmm. Use the site. Um, yeah, so it's another IP for the stable, obviously with Microsoft having 15 studios now to create games. Um, and it did sell pretty well. That's the other part of it, too, is the mm-hmm. game sold well. You wonder, though, whether that turned people off to a sequel or whether that's encouraging for a sequel. Yeah. I don't know how to kind of look at that. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good concept, a good idea. The execution could be improved, but they could improve it for the sequel and hopefully they will so that's it that's the playstation news from the last seven days that's enough there's also rumors flying around that in february we're going to see a big playstation 5 reveal event yeah february 5th i think it's that's my to birthday there. by the way mm. yeah how awesome would that be yeah. <laughs> on my birthday we get play, like playstation 5 that'd be great you can tune the turn the two of february into a p pretty easily and then five uh. like, i think, I, think I, I bet that's what they do you may be right actually <laughs> that's funny that you would even think about that right now but you're right it's probably true uh so anyway it looks like we're gonna get big news even more big news about playstation 5 here in just a few weeks so stay tuned we'll be here to talk about all of it on game face uh next up we've been talking about uh Lots of best of decade stuff over the last month. Even though if you watch the latest episode of Pactor Factor, Pack would argue very strongly that it is not, in fact, the next decade. Well, he's wrong. Well, the other thing that I would say is somebody replied to him on YouTube and said, a decade is just 10 years. Well, here's It doesn't matter when it starts or ends. It's just a period of 10 years. Well, here's the more important thing. We don't count decades down from year one. No one does that. It's just people who can't put certain things together, applying the millennium thing, yeah. where you know, millennium doesn't start right. till 2001 because you're counting from thousands of years from year one and there was no year yeah. zero. They're applying that to decades. No one counts decades that way. Right. 
the decades the decades thing was invented very recently as a pop culture tracking mechanism to determine arbitrary standards by when fashion and and trends occur. You mean the, what we're about to do? The eighties, <laughs> the eight nineteen eighties are the ten years in the in the twentieth century that be, have the eight in the tens column. Yeah. That's it. No one's counting decades down from the birth of Christ. That's not what <laughs> anyone fucking does. The eight nineteen ninety is not in the eighties. I know. You, I know incredibly strange people <laughs> like the decade is over we are in the the 20s now yeah. we, it, like there's no argument on that well and you like, can't because 2020 2020 <laughs> it's that's all it is the only determining factor on the decade thing is what the tens place is yeah. and it's a two so we're in yeah. the 20s yeah. unless you think 1980 was the 70s it's not <laughs> you're right <laughs> I, I got no fucking patience for this thing. It's so stupid. It's just you've because learned. Because everyone's been doing. You've it. learned a correct thing with the Millennium thing, and now you're taking that information and arbitrarily applying it to something that doesn't have anything to do with it. You're right. This yeah, is why you right. have to look puzzles up. Yeah. <laughs> Think. You're so right. You you are right. Absolutely, and I agree with you. Like it's like once it's turned nineteen eighty or nineteen ninety, you that's think the you're applying lateral thinking, but all you did was fall backwards into the toilet. <laughs> this is great. Uh, so anyway, I agree with you, Matt, and I I, know you. I do believe that this is that has been the last <laughs> decade, and we've talked about a lot of this stuff celebrating the last ten years, and uh, the MPD decided to celebrate as well. And it dug into its archives of data and gave us a nugget. Because you know how MPD is. It's like every little drip of data they give you, they act like they're doing you a favor. Well, they did us a favor. And they supplied the top 20 best-selling games from the past decade. Um, And we have the list if you want to bring it up, Jared. So here they are. The top 20 best-selling games oh. from the last 10 years. Do you like codfish? <laughs> yeah. Because we have codfish. <laughs> let's see. Let's do the counting. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 in the top 12 Wow. are Call of Duty. And, and one then more, there's... 10. Is it, are half of them Call of Duty? Yeah. Half of the games are Call of Duty because you have, unfortunately, our favorite Call of Duty yeah. from the last several years Dead all last. the way down there yeah. at 15. Of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> How funny that. is that? Uh, but still, Grand Theft Auto V did take the top spot. So at least so- some other game did something on this list other than Call of Duty. Then you go down the list. Are you surprised to see Red Dead Redemption 2 at number 7 already? That is fast. Yeah. That's, that's real fast. Because you look at all these other games around it, they've all been they had out. a lot of time, yeah. Yeah. And had, you know, all these other platforms. Like, they it just now got on PC for Red mm-hmm. Dead. Um, not that they even count PC sales anymore, I don't believe, on MPD. I think it's just all retail console. Um, but, yeah, I'm surprised to see it up there so high. But then I think about all the marketing that Rockstar has done for the game. Maybe it's not that surprising, but still, that's impressive, man. For a game that's only been out for a couple years, to be number seven of the last ten one years. Year. Yeah, I guess it's one year. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy, dude. Well, that's impressive. Don't underestimate the rock star. Are you surprised how low Minecraft is? Um, lo- is this, so is this by dollars or is it by This is units? sales, yeah. So it's units or money? Dollars. Okay, money. So, well, Minecraft's cheaper than all those other games. So yeah. I guess that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I guess it does. All MPD stuff is always based on money. Okay. It's not really based on unit sales anymore. Um, back in the day, they did. That was how mm-hmm. they originally did MPD. But right. now, they mark it by money, and then I think they go back and they look at, even when they put out lists like this, they don't just say it's unit sales. It's how much money the games have generated. Still, though, Minecraft being at number 10, that was still pretty surprising to me, at least. Um, they're at 12. Call of Duty Modern Warfare that just came out like a month and a half ago. Mm-hmm. That's impressive. Yeah. And I don't know why. Still did better than Infinite Warfare. Dude, I... Mean, I just, it. The fact that Modern Warfare, which came out like a few months ago, has outsold Skyrim. That's insane. That's crazy. I mean, I was shocked how low Skyrim was, too. Yeah, I thought Skyrim would be higher. Yeah. I mean, because it's come out for every freaking platform, yeah. like, twice. And it came out in, like, 2011. <laughs> I like, know. It's, like, it's had all decades. I know. It's insane. Like, this list is really, really eye-opening to me. Um, I mean, Modern Warfare 20... That game sucks. I'm sorry... 
I really hate this year's Call of Duty, man. Like, I didn't. I didn't finish it. I just. I, I, I ended campaign. up just. Un- I uninstalled it after it started taking up 160 gigs on my hard drive. I was like, you. There's no reason for that. Here's the thing. I'm still playing it because it is the game that I play when I'm like, have 10 minutes to burn or what, and I hate it. I hate it. I don't like anything about it. Like, I don't like how they do like the loadouts. There's all kinds of problems with it. Like, if you're, if you have like a gun on your back. And you back up against the wall. Your gun clips through the wall, and then people shoot you through the wall. Like, <laughs> dude, the spawns, the spawns in this game are insane. Sometimes you spawn, and you're staring at a wall. It's like, what the hell? Where am I? Like, it's so bad. Ugh, anyway. <laughs> why don't play multiplayer? <laughs> I don't know why it's so popular. Infinite Warfare definitely deserves to have better sales than that game. It's not even freaking close. At least they tried to do something different with that game. This is like, oh, we're out of ideas. Let's go back to the old way. Uh, yeah, Skyrim. Now, is that the whole Black Ops series in there? Yeah. Look For good reason. Yeah, I mean, they're well, the best Call of Duties. I don't think so. But, I mean, if you focus on multiplayer, sure. Yeah. But I, I, the campaigns on the Black Ops have never done anything. And obviously, Black Ops 4's campaign was terrible because it didn't exist. There wasn't one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Black Ops are my favorite Call of Duty games. I'm not going to begrudge anyone for disagreeing, but just for me personally, they're the ones I've enjoyed the most. Um, down at 14, Mario Kart 8. I thought that might be higher. Yeah. Although, I mean, it sold very well on the Switch, but it's yeah, it's had a limited time to do that. The and problem was it was released for the Wii U. Wii U. Yeah. <laughs> So even if you and it was sold a, a very high selling Wii U game, but it was still a Wii U game. I mean, even if you had a hundred percent penetration with your installed base, you still only sell ten million copies. Yeah, think about that. Like nothing on Wii U had a chance to make this list, but this game. This was pretty much the only one. And there's one other that technically released that we'll get to here in a second uh, for the Wii U, but it wasn't really a Wii U game. Um, and then another Call of Duty, Infinite Warfare at 15, then Battlefield 1 and Battlefield 4 side by side. Which of those two do you think is the better game? Uh, I liked Battlefield 1 better. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The campaigns are crap in both of them pretty much, but... Yeah, but I mean, we kind of expect that from DICE at this point. Yeah. I don't think they're ever going to figure that out. Yeah, it's pretty cool to see, like, the better game get the more sales. Like, I like the concept of Battlefield 1 and Battlefield uh, 5's campaign where there's just, like, stories from around the war. Yeah. But they're just not... They don't do anything to hook me. Yep. And then number 18, Destiny. The game that didn't sell well enough for Activision to remain interested. Mm -hmm. The 18th best selling game from the last 10 years was not good enough for Activision. Yeah. Well, at this, although at the same time. When you look at all their other games. Look at all the other Activision (laughs) games above it. Clearly, there's some skewed standards. Yeah. I mean, look, there may be a bunch of, like, hidden and sunken costs in dealing with Mm. Bungie and Destiny that we don't know about that maybe helped kind of, you know, motivate Activision to kind of part ways. But still, it's hard to believe that a studio could could release a game that's the 18th bestseller from the last decade, and that wasn't good enough for the public. I mean, I'm sure they were just expecting another Call of Duty level success. You know, they wanted... They got pretty close. I mean, even Ghost sold way up there, so... yeah. I mean, and look, even Infinite Warfare outsold Destiny, but still, it's a new IP. Yeah. I don't know. I think it was very short-sighted to uh, cut bait on Bungie for Activision, but that's just my opinion. Um, number 19, this is a game I was talking about earlier that did technically release for Wii U, but really, it's a Switch game, and that's Legends of, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. That's pretty impressive for it to crack the top 20 Mm-hmm. Um, on a platform that's only a few years old at this point, and it was a launch game. and Pretty huge attach rate. It is. I mean, if you look at the MPD for December, it's still in the top 20. Mm-hmm. So when people buy a Switch, they buy Breath of the Wild. Um, it was actually interesting to look at the games from December. Did you see that uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order did very, very well? Mm-hmm. Um Really, really impressed with it. Um, it was the it's Respawn's best-selling game ever already. Mm-hmm. Um, it ended up second in December. Obviously, Call of Duty Modern Warfare took first. It ended up second. Uh, sequel guaranteed at this point. Um, already working on it. Yeah, already working on it. It's great to see Respawn get rewarded mm-hmm. because... I hope they get rewarded with an extra eight months of polish time this yeah, time. Yeah, me too. But Because uh, I have loved every game it's made, and none of them have done exceptionally well. No. 
I mean, obviously, Call of Duty did when they were <coughs> Infinity Ward. Right. But since they've become Respawn, yeah. they have not really had a financial hit. Yeah, Titanfall 1 did, did pretty good. Did okay. Because well. it was but like Titan... the only game available at launch yeah. of Xbox One. But Titanfall one. 2 deserved a lot more than it got. Um, you can get that game sometimes for like four bucks now. I know. And it is and if you ever probably see it, the buy it. Yeah, it, it's probably still the, it's probably the best first person shooter campaign of the decade. Yep. I'd agree with that. Like, it's incredible. Yep. I agree, uh, but it's good. If you haven't played the them. Titanfall 2 campaign, you are screwing yourself. You are, for sure. But it is great to see Respawn finally get rewarded financially yeah. for its great work, because also, it's done great work all along. Also great to see a Star Wars game that's a single-player only adventure Metroid. I, I mean, so like it's crazy. exactly the game that EA said doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> it's, this is literally the game yeah. that EA was like, no one wants this. And it's yeah. like, hey, guess what? Yeah, we do, assholes. Like, that's why I keep saying, like, <laughs> I think there might be, you know, they apparently they have another game in there, Star Wars game in there somewhere, not the Motive one, maybe, but might, might be Motive was working on it, but it's not the one that got canceled. I think there's another Star Wars game this year. Yeah. I think there's another one in, in here that isn't Battlefront. God, I hope it's not Battlefront. Well, now that you bring that up, Battlefront does bring up the rear. It's yeah. number twenty of the best-selling games of the last decade. The first one from twenty fifteen. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was a that was a hype around that that was part part of the wave that was with you know Force, Force Awakens that was just like nothing else. I it mean, was also still pretty early in the gen, and mm-hmm. we hadn't really seen the Star Wars world on that platform yeah. at that fidelity. Yet. And there's an L, yeah, there's also an element. I mean, we hadn't seen a Star Wars game in almost ten years at that point. That's true. Yeah. And uh, not ten, more like eight. Force, Force Unleashed 2 was the last one before yeah. that, and that was 20, 20, is that 2010? Sounds right. So like five years. Five years since the last one. God knows who long, how long since the last good one. And like, <laughs> it was, I remember showing that to some of my friends that, you know, didn't follow games that like Star Wars or like a Vela, and like, they couldn't believe it looked like that. Jaw drop, you know, it, yeah. It's amazing. You know, when you see yeah. the Stormtrooper armor that looks like it just stepped off the screen, it's crazy. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, I can understand. And I love that EA was disappointed with Battlefront 2's sales. I'm like, look, even without the loot box controversy, that game was never going to sell 15 million copies, <laughs> dude. That was Force Awakened fever. <laughs> hey, Jared, bring that list back up real quick. So, Matt, of all the games on this list, which one is least deserving? To be on the list? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say Call of Duty Ghosts. Me too. <laughs> Like, <laughs> me too. <laughs> that is that is the worst game on that list. To me, that is the worst game on the list. Yep, absolutely. But it still sold like mad. Yeah, Number I mean, six. That was back when Call of Duty's inertia could still carry it. That yeah, far. it did. Like, yeah, I feel like people have gotten choosier. Yep, it doesn't work anymore. Absolutely, it doesn't. Um, what strikes you the most, other than the fact that Call of Duty dominates, which I think you knew was going to happen before? Well, I mean, it's that like plus that. like Grand Theft Auto Five is yeah, just destroying everything. A juggernaut. <laughs> Um, I think it's funny that... What's Grand Theft Auto 6 going to do? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think it's funny that even just even the failed Call of Duty, Infinite Warfare, which, again, is my favorite Call of Duty of the decade, yeah. um, naturally, uh, still 15th best-selling yeah, game yeah, of the decade. Yeah. Like, like, you know, oh, they made, they made a hefty profit on that game still, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. We'll never see anything like it again, but... Yeah. Especially, I'll, well, I don't know. They still do all the the cameos and stuff in Call of Duty. For yeah, but part. I just like to see another thing set in that like sci-fi universe. Like yeah. I love, I love where they took that. It'll and never happen. It'll never happen again. Yep. Also, you put me in a jet. You put me in a space fighter. Put like you know flight stuff. I like. Um, I guess the only other surprise would be like, yeah, I, I mean, I know it's probably with, involved in digital sales and the price of things, or but I just it does surprise me a little bit that Minecraft is higher. Yep. Just because I feel like it's constantly selling, but I guess it. Uh, who knows? I don't know what NPD tracks if they track digital on everything or no. It's probably, sold. They don't, they don't track it on like iPads and stuff. Right? Yeah, I don't like, think so. I and just it, feel like so much of its sales are to like tiny portable screens to keep children quiet. Yeah, yeah. Like you're you're missing that if you don't. Count and when that. it originally launched, it was fifteen bucks. Is that right? I think the beta, or the alpha was fifteen or ten, and then the beta was fifteen, and then the final was twenty. Yeah, if I remember. Right. Yeah, so I mean, even from the beginning, they've never generated yeah, a ton of money spe- per sale. If you're sale. counting specifically dollar value amounts sold, like yeah, Minecraft's at a disadvantage against these sixty dollars games. Yeah, because you realize it has to sell three copies to equal one. Right. Sold from the other games, still very very impressive for a little indie game built by a team of like eight people. It's yeah. it's amazing. Okay, one more bonus quiz for you, Matt. Before we move on. So we just talked about 2010 to 2019. And we Mm -hmm. know what the best-selling games there are. What do you think is the best-selling game from the year 2000 to 2009? Um, 
I would guess... We need the Jeopardy music right now. That would be either Vice City or Modern Warfare 2. Nope. No? It was Guitar Hero 3. Wow. Guitar Hero 3. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a name I've not heard in a long time. Isn't that insane? Wow. Yeah. I was, like, blown away by that. I was like, You forget what? how big that was. How oh, big was the music gigantic. game thing was. It was. How we, you remember we just had, we'd have full parties that were entirely to play rock yeah. band together. we just get together. Like people would clear the living room out. Oh, to yeah. Fit the drums in. And oh, shows. it was worth it. It was so yeah. great. I had that's some of the best oh, times great of my time. life playing great games. Time. It was amazing. Like, I could play games and with anybody. And then it just stopped. stopped. Dude, like, that era... I could play games with anybody. Mm-hmm. It was the first time in my life that I could play video games with anyone. And even if you just handed up the mic and let them karaoke, like, they're fine with that. Like, it was definitely a different era. And I don't know mm-hmm. why people got sick of it. It's still fun. It's still awesome. I always, I always thought, um, I don't give him credit for a lot, but Tom Chick from Quarter to Three, when he reviewed the original Guitar Hero, said that playing multiplayer with of, of Guitar Hero is the closest you'll ever get to having sex with your with your male friends. <laughs> and I'm like, that's really yeah. close to something. Like, I don't know why. Yeah. I would never have thought of that. But, yeah, there is a weird sort of in sync. So, and, like, the rock band thing expanded that. Yeah. It was like, Especially once you got to where it was, like, all the band. Yeah, the whole it band. was like a modern version of Twister uh-huh. almost. It's great. It's like that moment where you're all in harmony together. It's like and just I've, like Twister, it ended pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. It's like when I talk about sports, about when you play football, it's like you have 11 people who all have a very specific role and when everybody does exactly what they're supposed to do, it's like this amazing mm-hmm. feeling. And it's yeah. the same thing. And you got everybody on the microphones when they put harmonies in. And everyone's in. It was nailing great. it. Everybody, yeah. yeah. It was great. It's like nothing else. It was fun. It was a great time. I still have all the stuff like in a box in the garage. I've never yeah, I never taken it out. I have like the crazy expensive wooden guitars that look yeah, like I, real I guitars. The, and... I have the Stratocaster. Yeah. Like the full like replica thing. That's one of the only ones. I used to have like 10 yeah. guitars. I got rid of a bunch of them. I kept that one. You can't even give those away now. No. like you. I, just... threw, I threw most of them out. <laughs> Out. Like it was, because you could, it's a lot of plastic going into a like I took a somewhere. whole when I moved I took a whole bunch of games and like, accessory stuff I didn't want anymore to um, like the, the, the gameplay on Venice and uh, they refused some of the guitar they're like mm, we don't really yeah. we, don't, we don't need we a PlayStation really get- Two <laughs> Guitar Hero Two guitar we're not really in the market for that one uh, fair well, enough I'm like well you want to just smash it <laughs> they're like ah. <laughs> all right let's move on we're gonna talk about Switch. Briefly, um, patents seem to be popping up all over the place lately, and that's that's par for the course when you have two new platforms coming out. We've mm-hmm. seen a lot of patents for PlayStation 5. Uh, sporadically, we see some stuff from Nintendo and for Switch, and just literally this week, on January 16th, Nintendo filed a brand new patent for a Joy-Con add-on. And it is a... I don't even know how to explain it. It's a stylus. Mm-hmm. But it's not just a piece of plastic that, like, slides into, like, the Joy-Con holder or whatever. There's actual electronics in the stylus that allows it to communicate with the Joy-Con. So, if you're, say, for instance, you're using, you're trying to use the Joy-Con as a pointer and you're drawing something on screen, you can, you can adjust a setting on the stylus that tells the game to start drawing, like, a thicker line. So it, it communicates in some way with the actual controller. And you can see it's just kind of built into that piece of plastic that I never use. <laughs> like, I play Switch always, Joy-Con separate, but I never have that thing snapped onto them because they're a pain in the ass to get off. Yeah, that's what I mean, I never use the Joy-Cons, but if I did, I wouldn't put that on because, yeah, getting them off is annoying. Yeah, so I don't. But that's what this stylus is built into. And it's a little strange because... There aren't really many games in the West where you really need a no. stylus. This makes me think that they're got, they got an art academy in the in the pipeline. Well, Brain Training came out in Japan, mm. and it hasn't come out here. But so Japan has been getting games where this would be, I don't know, more functional with mm-hmm. more than the West has. My guess is you're right. Like that stuff's probably going to start coming to the East, and that's probably why Nintendo has worked on this new piece of hardware for the Joy Cons. In a Switch version of QuickBooks. Yeah, and you can see exactly what I was talking about there. They are talking about how just the communication mm-hmm. from the stylus, it changes what the what happens in-game. Yeah, which is the thing you'd usually have to do with an option on the screen. Right, yeah. I mean, it's, it's cool. I mean, I, 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 
I'm trying to think of a scenario in which I would want to buy this, and I'm not coming up with one, but, like, hey, why not? Yeah. I, well, I think at this point, Nintendo's just got to the place with Switch where it's like, let's just start throwing everything against the wall. Yeah. We, you see a lot of this stuff in Japan. Like, if you go to Japan and you go to Akihabara or anywhere, really, and just shop around the game stores in Tokyo, you see all this crazy stuff for Nintendo platforms that you never even knew existed. Like, just peripherals and goofy controllers and stuff that never came to the West but are, are prevalent and often released in Japan. Um, and then a lot of that stuff never does come here. Mm. But more functional things like a stylus, like, that absolutely will probably make it over. And I'm just kind of surprised that there hasn't been a stylus already. I mean, you have a touchscreen. Yeah, I mean, you can use a stylus on it like, yeah. if you want. Yeah, it does. It doesn't work great, though. Have you no. tried using one? I used my, my I have like one of the fancy metal 3DS ones, and I tried that once, and it just didn't. It actually seems to work right. better with your fingers, the yeah. Switch touchpad, for some reason. Like, 3DS worked better with the stylus, mm-hmm. but the Switch seems to work better with just your fingers. I don't know why. Well, I think because I think the, the capacitor touchscreen just is better that way. But like, and I think they design it for that. I just don't like to do it because you get fingerprints all over it. Yeah, so. it makes it. Then you can't. It's hard to see the screen and blah blah mm. blah. Uh, but anyway, it's just the kind of pre- it's kind of the screen they use wants you to touch it, not to poke at poke at it with a stick. Yeah, because um, they assume more people are going to use their fingers. I well, I'll say they this. are. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. I'll say this. Like, I hardly ever use a touch screen on Switch. Same. Like. I don't know the last time I used it. I don't know if I... I uh, sometimes I forget it. I forget one. it even is one. Yeah. yeah. That's the crazy part about it. I and mean, maybe that's why we haven't seen a stylus, because they're like, nobody's using it. They probably have data that says nobody touches the screen of the Switch unless they're cleaning it. That's the only time I touch the screen on my Switch. Um, but anyway, always want to keep you guys up on the latest hardware happenings. We're giving a lot of love to PlayStation and Microsoft these days, because obviously they have two consoles coming at the end of the year. I think it's only fair that we cover some of the hardware stuff related to Switch uh, that's making the rounds. And there you go. There's a stylus coming. That's more than a stylus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Still not confirmed mm-hmm. for the West, but my guess is probably on the way. Uh, next, we're going to talk about Bethesda. Matt, speaking of the last decade... Is there a publisher that has fallen farther in the last 10 years than Bethesda? Uh, not that I can think of that's still in business. Right. That's uh, still operating. Yeah. It's been a tough like road. Like Interplay didn't do too well. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even know if that was, that was this decade. Well, if you think about their last big game. like their, THQ. THQ. Yeah, they're gone. But if you, if, in terms of who survived, yeah, Bethesda's probably, yeah. Certainly reputation-wise. Yeah, because, I mean, their last really big hit is Skyrim. And we just saw that as, like, the best-selling game from the last 10 years. So it was released, like, almost 10 years ago. Um, Since then, we've had Fallout 4, which sold pretty well. I mean, what did it end up doing? Like, 12, 14 million, something like that? Yeah, that sounds right. Somewhere in that ballpark. Um, And that's been it. Since then, Bethesda's just really struggled to get a hit. It's, you know, most of its games have sold anywhere from, like, two to five or six million copies. There's the debacle that is Fallout 76. It's still, like, a chain around their ankle dragging them down. Bethesda needs good news at this point. Yes. Aside from how well their mobile games seem to be doing, which is random. Yeah, I mean, I I think that helping a lot yeah uh, the mobile game thing um blades blades does get pretty regular updates and events and stuff there. i mean they're supporting them well um i just ran out of patience with blades fallout um, shelter was a big fallout hit. shelter did, did yeah. get, was really good um they, they certainly haven't lost their touch there yeah uh but elder scrolls online is doing well it, it is doing they well. just had a new yeah. expansion this week yeah um, which I also didn't play. You know, that Skyrim. I'm stuff. wondering how much that generates for them per month. I don't know. I don't know anything about the economics of, of that game, but like they're selling the expansion for full price, so it must be doing all right. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd sell it for half yeah. price if you have an audience that's willing to. I mean, it's it annoying up. that like Elder Scrolls Six is so far away, but like you you get you know you scratch the itch with Elder Scrolls Online, like well, and you see a whole lot of the the continent that you you the haven't seen and in all other that. stuff. The characters, and like, and elsewhere all is really cool. The races, like seeing and... the places that you haven't seen, in, or going back to places that have been in yeah, the older games. For it's, sure, like there's good stuff. There's good stuff in their in their catalog. catalog. I'll never it's, play it. But... Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but I'll, it, I'll take your word for it. I mean, it, it is action driven. I mean, it's just like playing Skyrim basically with a little bit more like triggerable abilities. Yep. Um, it works. But, 
Yeah, like in terms of kind of the stuff that they they people want and are known for, and basically where their bread and butter used to be, which is you know Skyrim, the top selling games of the last decade. Uh, you wonder, like you wonder if that's going to happen again. Yeah, I'm really starting to wonder, and I think. We've talked about this before, how we've been flabbergasted that Starfield and Elder Scrolls Six are still so far away. Mm -hmm. When if we had been sitting in meetings with Bethesda, we could have looked ahead at its release schedule and been like, oh, no. Like, these games need to come out, like, way before. Mm -hmm. Then Fallout 76 happens. I'm assuming there's a fire alarm going off at Bethesda after that because, as you have said before, that was their bridge. Fallout yeah. 76 was going to be the bridge until they get to these other two games. Yeah, I feel like Fallout 76, they wanted to kind of be like the equivalent of Elder Scrolls Online. They wanted it to be the thing they could kind of ride through the, what was, they obviously knew was going to be a long development cycle for Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6, which doesn't seem like it's even really started yet. Well, this is the news. Yeah. So the news is that development is kind of wrapping up on Starfield and that Bethesda is hiring in mass for mm -hmm. Elder Scrolls Six, which it means we're probably finally hitting full production. Right. Which again, to me, is flabbergasting that they have not started full production on the most important game, probably in the company's yeah. history. Well, I mean, Todd straight up said when they announced it uh, in 2018, we haven't started it. The tech's not there yet. Like we, you know, basically like they couldn't start it yet. Like whatever they want to do with it, they couldn't do it until the next gen hardware probably was finalized and what they knew what they were working with for the next 10 years. Um, Starfield, God knows what the hell that, I mean, I'm, I definitely want to see what Bethesda Game Studios does with a sci-fi space oriented, you know, that's a really cool idea. Oh yeah. Me. I'm, I'm um, really excited for that. Game. Yeah. This was the most exciting part so just, of this news. So we're is just going to Starfield is finally nearing completion. I mean, do you near, believe that? No. I don't um, either. I think nearing I completion means like end of 2021. Yeah. But like that is near completion for Bethesda. That is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Why do you think it's taken them so long to create Elder Scrolls Six? I think they're just waiting to make it something different. Not super different, but like Skyrim was a refinement of what came before in Oblivion. Um, and then I think whatever they want to do with this next game, I think they want to expand it out into something even bigger and something even even more bold. And even going back uh, to like when Skyrim came out, and I remember uh, uh, talking to some of the Bethesda people about the combat in the game, and like they really want to improve the combat. Like they, they really want they, they do need to, but they really want it to be better than it is. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of what they wanted to do with that required some higher level higher level tech or you hit a point where it got so late in this generation there's no reason to make it for this gen you just want to move on to the next one so you have to, you know you're stuck in a holding pattern that's what that's what Fallout 76 and probably Starfield are for are for sort of buying time to get Elder Scrolls 6 to be what they want it to be it's just insane i mean Skyrim came out literally almost like 10 years ago so if it was a, an engine problem you could have built three engines by now like it's mm -hmm. just the whole thing makes no it's just I, I, feel I think, like, it's, a, I think it's, a te it's a hardware problem. I, I, think it's, I think it's a power problem. I feel like we make a lot of excuses for Bethesda. Like, I feel like we're always, because we love its games, and, and in all honesty, I'll just be perfectly honest, I love the people that work there. Like, I think they're really good people, and I kind of root for them. But I think because of that, I find myself making excuses for them very often. And now that I'm kind of, the rubber's kind of hit the road on this stuff, like, there was just some really poor planning going on at Bethesda. Mm -hmm. And misjudging their own products. Some of that. I also think, I do think Elder Scrolls Online was sort of uh, a way to keep the, what they thought would keeping Elder Scrolls content sort of in the pipeline without having to make a brand new Elder Scrolls game. Because there's no reason you couldn't have made Elder Scrolls 6 in the time between Skyrim and now oh, yeah. and made Elder Scrolls 7 the next gen game. Um, I probably would have liked that better than Fallout 4. Uh, <laughs> but they didn't they, you know and and because and i have i do play elder scrolls online periodically and it is because i want some elder scrolls fix you want to be in that world yeah. yeah and like that's you know and i guess that's an effective strategy for something that milks me for more money than uh, just buying elder scrolls 6 <laughs> yep. once would have done but uh like i see where like why it happens it's not it does, i'm not saying i'm happy about it or it's how you know as james cameron said uh, of alien 3 it's not how i would have done it <laughs> but it's uh it's what we got 
And right now, like, I just kind of hope that they hold out long enough to get it made because I don't know what their financial situation is. They're not a publicly held company. They obviously don't have to answer to shareholders, so they have a little more freedom to kind Which of Which is like, why they're in the situation that try they're in and right yeah, now. To try and I think fail. that's part yeah, of the problem. Definitely part of it. Like, I, I guess they have no one to be accountable a to. A publicly traded company would have really had to shift gears oh, they're much, <laughs> much faster than Oh, this. my God. People, their stock would be in the toilet yeah. right now if they were a publicly traded company. So – it's look, it's, bad things happen sometimes that are completely out of your mm-hmm. control, and there's nothing you can do. It's just it's life. That's the way it is. This is not a case of that. This is Bethesda's own doing. Mm-hmm. That well, the other problem they have is, of course, they're the the not third party, but the games that that are put out by they put out that aren't by Bethesda Game Studios. Um, tank in the same like they're great like they almost everything they put out is great yeah. and it they don't sell the immersive sim yeah but like i mean doom does obviously doom's gonna be ahead yep um but it's just like so like, it's just their 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 catalog is just this endless list of games that deserve to be played by more people than they were yep and i don't Agreed. know i don't know how to fix that. that's the what part th- where i was saying sometimes bad stuff just happens yeah like that's kind of been like, there is no reason millions of copies of Prey shouldn't have sold. Or Dishonored 2, or, Dishonored or 2. I mean, you can go on down the line. But like the, the last like really like bad game like that that I think they put out was Wet. Yeah, that yeah. was like 10 years ago. Yeah, and then they had Battle Cry, which was in development for forever, and then disappeared, and they had to write even that a, off. Even had a studio named after it. Yeah, and they had to write it all off. So, I don't know. When do you think we're going to see it? Like, I have a feeling now Elder Scrolls 6 is going to be like, one of the last games that comes out for, like, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. I don't know about that, but I would not be surprised. I, I've said many times, I don't expect to see Elder Scrolls 6 before 2024. Yeah, so um, that would be exactly what I'm saying. Like, it would be one of the swan songs well, no, that's for PlayStation years. 5. Yeah, four I mean, years. that's where that's, things that's are right, trying to wrap no, it up. No, it does not. It's right in the middle. <laughs> like, you're, like the, the generation is going to be six, seven years minimum. So you're right in the middle. You're in, You're in the... You're, in the, you're kind of in the sweet spot there. You're, you're, you figured out the hardware. People know what to do. They're, they're gonna, I, th- I think it's, it's going to be fine. Um, in terms of what the game is, what we play, I don't know about financially and whatever. whatever that's good. Starfield, hopefully, will be a kind of a third pillar in the Bethesda Game Studios sort of lineup where, you know, right now we've, you know, we've spent a long time sort of alternating between Elder Scrolls and Fallout, and it would be nice to have a third different thing in there that they can lean on. It could be. Um, I mean, case. frankly, I am a little more excited about to see what Starfield is than to play another Elder Scrolls game. What I was like, just going to say know. is it could be that Starfield, once we play it, nobody cares about Elder yeah. Scrolls again. That could be the magic laser bullet we need. Yeah, and, people could play it and be like, well, crap, I don't need Elder Scrolls now. This yeah. game's better. And play you this know? for three years and buy but, it four times. But and, Bethesda has to nail it. Yeah. Like, it's... It's on thin ice. Like, it can't really afford to have too many more screw-ups. Mm-hmm. Or it's going to be in deep trouble. So, ZeniMax, maybe, I hate to say this because I always hate saying this. Uh, you want artists to have freedom to do what they want. And I think sometimes that can backfire. And I think ZeniMax has maybe let Bethesda mm-hmm. be a little more autonomous so in. Much, I, I do think that if Fallout 76 had been good, we wouldn't be really having this conversation. Right, like, yeah. Like, that was the key. Yeah. Like, and, and Fallout 76 was a risk, and, you know, you know, Todd Howard did spend a lot of the time um, when they were announcing it saying, like, we've never done anything like this before and we're terrified. And... Uh, well, I for think, good reason. Yeah, I mean, for good reason. I mean, I think, I, th- I think one of the, re- like I've said, I think the reason we saw Starfield and Elder Scrolls Six announced that year is because they knew, they knew what Fallout 76 was going to be. Yeah. And they knew they had to give us hope somehow. <laughs> and that's what that was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, like, yeah, this was, I mean, that's the thing is Fallout 76 did not turn out tremendously well. I still have never played it. I don't care. I don't want that out of Fallout. I don't want to spend my money on what this became. They still haven't given up. There was a free weekend. I missed it. I would have played it then, but I didn't get around to it. Um, but, like, you can't say what... How do you convince somebody to pay for a month of this game? I don't know. After but, all the news that's but out there. I can't there. say that I look at this game and I'm like, well, they played it safe because they didn't. They, no, tried, they tried something here and it, did, didn't, and it yeah. didn't work. They did try something new. I'll give them that. I mean, at least new for the franchise, yeah. not new in general. Anything that new that they did in the genre was pretty much rejected unanimously. Yeah. So it was not – it was definitely a failed experiment. Uh, hopefully Bethesda can learn from it, and it's not going to be one of these things where it hurts them so bad that they can't learn from it. But 
I don't know. There's just been poor management there. I mean, that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. That's really what's happened across the board. You can go into all the details of it and get really granular about it. But the truth is, it's just been poorly managed. And I don't know who that person is that's responsible for that, but they probably should get I'm a, sure a it's new, more than one person. Yeah, but if there is one person, they should probably find a new person to do that because it has not worked out well. Uh, Bethesda should have had more than one game on that list that we just looked at of the 20 mm-hmm. best-selling. And it could have very easily if it had got some of the its more high-profile games out in a timely manner. So... I don't know. I'm always rooting for Bethesda because I love its games and I love the people there, but it just becomes more and more difficult, it seems, with like every passing quarter to to make excuses, in all honesty, for what's going on there right now. I don't know. It's a shame. But I'm not giving up hope on Starfield or Elder Scrolls, and I absolutely do believe that if Starfield is just Elder Scrolls with a sci-fi paint job, it could be even bigger. Yeah. So... There's an ace in the hole sitting there. Hopefully it doesn't take three years for that ace to be dealt out onto the table. We'll see. Uh, Next up, we're going to talk a little bit more about Nintendo, but mostly about Fire Emblem Three Houses. Um, And that's because it was a big week for Fire Emblem Three Houses. Not only has it won uh, Best Strategy Game of the Year for 2019, it did very well at the Game Awards. It did very well at each publication's Game of the Year awards. I think it won Best Strategy Game across the board pretty Pretty much much. from everybody. Not a whole lot of competition. No, it it was But it was very good. It was a bit of a thin year. It was a a good game. Yeah, I mean, I played this thing like 80 hours. It was not any any kind of... uh, Well, I hope you're ready to play it some more, Matt Kyle, because... There is an expansion coming. Mm-hmm. D- the first piece of DLC the is coming. The secret fourth house. But before we got that, we got s- it, the Byleth, the mm-hmm. main character from this game, is coming to Smash Brothers. So Nintendo went back in house finally. Or as we call it now, Smash Emblem. Yeah, pretty much. So Nintendo did go back in house um, mm-hmm. for this character after being mostly third party. I think for the last three uh, all but the first. The first one was the Piranha Plant. Yeah, and yeah. The, all the others were third party. Yeah. So they've gone back in house finally for this one. Byleth to me was not a, a, an especially charismatic character. No, I mean I liked their design. Like I, I liked what they looked like, both male and female. Um, and but, both will be coming to Smash as yeah. well. You'll get both the male. But I yeah, it was not exactly a. Um, a, a timeless design in general, especially in Fire Emblem. Context. Like I could think of three other characters in also three like, houses I'd rather have in Smash. Well, and also like there's so many sword-oriented <laughs> Fire Emblem characters in Smash already. They it's, all are pretty much. Yeah. But it's can what, you really put like an archer in no, Smash? You put a guy with an axe in there yeah, or something. That's I mean, what I'm saying. Spears like, or something. There, yeah. there were several characters in this game that I felt would be would have been a more interesting fit for Smash Brothers, but. Are you not going to put the main protagonist in there? Of course you are. Yeah. Like, it just makes too much sense. Um, again, you can play as both the male or the female version of the character, um, depending on what, what your preferences are. Um, it looks like he plays a lot like the prior sword-wielding Fire Emblem characters yeah, in Smash. Yeah, it makes them look a lot like... Uh, I wouldn't call him a clone. Not but, a clone, but it, it means not doesn't look that different from Chrom, yeah. really. Yeah. But, I mean, whatever. Yeah. I already paid for the season pass. I, oh, you paid I, for the Smash Brothers season pass? I think I did. I ah. think I bought the package, yeah. Oh, wow. Well. I know, but they're doing more. So you know, they're, they're, Yeah, there's, what, six more characters least, coming yeah. this year? Yeah. This year. So, yeah, I think what we said. I mean, be patient. You know. Yeah. I think what we said when this came out is turning out to be true. This is a platform now. It's not a game. It's a platform that's going to live on for a long, long time. And they're just going to keep adding new characters to it. And mm-hmm. Keep going that way. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's all you need to do. That's all. That's what people get excited about is who's going to be in it. Not necessarily, hey, is there this new goofy mode that you're going to play for an hour and not go back to? Smash is all about the roster, the stages, head-to-head play. Mm-hmm. At least in my opinion is, anyway. Um, and while we've been talking about Smash, there was also another big announcement for Three Houses General, and that is that there is a new house coming to Fire Emblem Three Houses. So are they going to call it Fire Emblem Four Houses now? But probably not. <laughs> definitely not. I mean, that's what they should probably call the DLC, right? Fire Emblem Four Houses? Or Fourth House. Or Fourth House or something like that. Um, I, th- I think, uh, I believe it's like 
on a separate island or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I know what people are thinking. They're like, oh, my gosh, there's going to be a new house you can choose from and play the – no, you, you can't no. – it's not like you're going to start the game over and then instead of three houses to choose from, there's four – and then you can play the whole game as that fourth house. No, that's not how it's happening. It is like a side story where there is this fourth house. And you're right. It's in like a new piece of territory. It does pick up after the end of the base game, um, which I think will have some added interest for people who made it all the way to the end. Uh, I, I would like to see the data on three houses to see how many people finished the game that purchased it. Mm -hmm. What would you guess would be the percentage of people who finished that game? I'd guess that's in like the 15 to 20% range. Yeah, yeah. At knowing what we know already about finish rates on big, mm -hmm. like, shooters and stuff that are lucky to get to, like, 35%. What did Cliffy say Gears completion rate was? Like, 38% or something yeah. like that? It was awful. 25% is like a really good pr completion rate for most games. Yeah, and that game, Gears, is easy to finish. Like, the first, all of them are pretty easy mm. to finish. There's not that much resistance. And still, people couldn't make it to the end. So I know it. 15% might be generous. This game is so big. It's just so huge. Like, you could have bought it back when it came out, and maybe you still haven't got to the end. Yeah. If you're not like us, you just don't sit down and play it all day because you need to for work or whatever. So, um Get your money's worth. Yeah. The funny part was when I saw this announced, I'm like, oh, finally. And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Like, most people aren't even ready for DLC for this mm -hmm. game yet. Uh, so it's good to see that they're supporting it so quickly um, after release with some new content. Um, I may go back and play this, actually. Like, I don't play hardly any DLC. I just don't have time. I can't go back and play a game again, usually. This one, I might... Like, download it and check it out at least and see if it can catch my fancy. Because yeah. okay. it's not like there's a whole lot of other stuff going on right now anyway. Um, but it seems like Nintendo slowly getting itself up to speed with everybody else. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's getting to the point where it's releasing DLC on schedule like most publishers do. Um, we still haven't really seen a game as a service yet from Nintendo. How would you mm. feel if Breath of the Wild ended up 2 ended up being that? Yeah, that would be a very silly choice. It would be. And I would be really surprised if Nintendo did that. But you also got to figure, it's trying to figure out, like, where is our game as a service? Where is this? I mean, their game is a service. Smash, I guess? Sort of. But their game as a service is really their mobile division. Yeah. Like, that's kind of what I imagine. Like, if, if, if there was going to be one game as a service thing they did, it would probably be something like Fire Emblem, a Fire Emblem permutation. Or... That is not a crazy way to approach a new F-Zero game. Yeah. That's true. That's a good point. For sure. Um, Maybe I just want F-Zero back. But. <laughs> no, well, we definitely all want F-Zero back. Like, what's <laughs> up with that? Like, that is one of the missing IP yeah. right now from the Switch, like, repertoire. Mm. Where's F-Zero? Where's all the racing stuff? Where's, where's F-Zero? Where's Wave Race? Where's 1080? Yeah, where's, where's Mario Kart? Nine. Yeah, new Mario Kart. Yeah. I mean, we've been playing Mario Kart 8 now for way too long. Where's Kirby's Air Ride? Yeah. <laughs> That's its other game as a service, Mario Kart 8. Yeah. Because it's continued to put out DLC for it. Um, but I think Nintendo is still hunting for that, like a console game as a service, something that can live on. Yeah. That isn't just like a duplicate of how other people do it. Right. Because Nintendo refuses to do what other people do. Yep. So. Yep. So, like, I can't see them putting out, like, a Destiny clone. No, uh-uh. They'll find some unique way to do it where they'll put their put its own spin on it mm. and that type of thing. It's not going to be, you're right, like, just a, an ape of Destiny. I mean, you can even look at Breath of the Wild. It had all those other games to look at, all those open-world action RPGs that were, mm. like, all the rage that it could have looked at to emulate to make Breath of the Wild, but it didn't. Like, it's still... Managed to make an action RPG that was unique from everything else that was coming out now. Some would argue that was for the better. Some would argue it was for the worse. Um, but regardless, it refused to just clone all the big games of the time. Mm. It still decided, like, no, we want to make sure we put some stuff in this that isn't in other games. I would argue it made the game worse. I, Not everyone would agree with that. Some people think it made the game better. So um, at the very least, Nintendo does strive to at least provide something unique with its games. Um, but, I mean, you know, you kind of have to have a gas at this point. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it's just kind of part of being in the industry. If you want to be successful, it's like that product that you have that's always churning revenue while you're working on all the other stuff that gives you the revenue spikes. Um, it's just kind of the way you have to structure your business now uh, if you want to be successful in games. Uh, and I'm sure Nintendo knows that, and Nintendo's looking at it. Uh, Fire Emblem, I don't think, is a vehicle for it. 
Um, but certainly the next Mario Kart could be. I mean, it has been a vehicle on mobile. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, that's Fire true. Fire Heroes is a f- monster. No, you're right. That's a good point, actually. So I guess I'm wrong there. It actually can be a vehicle. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they're trying to incorporate some of the mobile uh, concepts into this game. I wouldn't say that this first piece of DLC says that to me. No. But maybe in future releases it, it could become more apparent. We'll see. Wouldn't shock me. Yep. But uh, look, bottom line is more of a good thing, never a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. It's time to move on for our last topic of episode 196 here on Game Face at Sifted Games at Sifted.net. We're going to talk about the biggest game of January 2020. Without a doubt, it was the game that was the image for the thumbnail for the games of January. Uh, it's It'll be the best-selling game, or at least it'll be the game that'll generate the most revenue. And that game is Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Um Matt, I'm uh, rhetorical question. You've have you how much have you played of this? Uh, played about a half an hour at E3. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll drive this one. Feel mm-hmm. free to ask me questions as we go, though, because I know that this game is just burning. Well, a- <laughs> most most of the questions begin with why. Yeah. yeah. But, uh- <laughs> so let me just preface this discussion by saying something I've shared many many times. I am not a Dragon Ball fan. Do I hate it? The IP, no, I wouldn't go that far. I would have to care more to hate it. Yeah, it's exactly. Just like, it's just a, it's just <laughs> That's a, thing, a good way to put it. It's just a thing I was too old for. Like, yeah. I, I, get, I mean, I know it's old. It's you know, it, it was old when I was a kid. Really, it was it was around at the time, but it didn't air in America. Yeah, it wasn't shown when we were at kids. the time. I, mean, I have friends who grew up in Europe, and it was shown when they were kids in my, my, our age. They, yeah. It was shown when they were like you know, in the eighties and late eighties. So they did grow up with it. And love it, but I didn't. The first time I saw it was when it aired here, and I had to watch it in the store I managed with the owner's grandkids because he wouldn't let it air in his store because he didn't <laughs> want to see this shit. Yeah. Uh, so I had to watch the whole thing. I watched the whole thing, you know, day by day. Um, but I was uh, 23, so <laughs> it was uh, not as engrossing as it was yeah. for the 10-year-old grandkids who loved it. They, lo- yeah, you know, yeah. they loved it. But the like- way I look, I kind of compared Dragon Ball to, like, Transformers for me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm sure there's a lot of people who look at those old Transformer cartoons that really turned me into a hardcore Transformers fan, and they're like, "What? Like, shame. oh, they're terrible." I know you watch them, and yeah. it's like they're hard to watch. So I try not to beat up on Dragon Ball fans mm-hmm. too much. Like, I don't get it. I think it's corny. I think it's silly, and I definitely think it's targeted to very young people. But look, mm-hmm. it's different strokes for different folks. So I'm not going to bang on Dragon Ball when I talk about this game. Um, I'm you know I'll I'm bang on Dragon Ball games because I don't know why they can't. Nail this, yeah, uh, and they definitely I mean, the, do I mean, not fi- nail it. The fighting game, you know, yeah, there have been some good fighting great. games. Fighters, the fighters is, is fighters. Great. Um, it's just whenever they try to make like this kind of action RPG adventure game, it's just so the it like, is. Like I don't yeah. know why. So this retells the story that if you're a Dragon Ball fan, you know all too well. Um, it's like the twelfth game that's retold the same story. Mm-hmm. Um, this game starts, you've already fought Piccolo and defeated him, um, and then you're kind of going home as, like, the warrior to your family, and that's kind of where this game picks up, and then Piccolo comes back because you're only one of, like, five Saiyans left in the world, and one of the other ones comes and shows up and says, hey, you're supposed to be destroying Earth, and instead you're, like, friends with all these people, and then I'm not going to spoil what happens next for those of you who don't know. The story the f- of five Dragon people Ball Z. who care that have not seen <laughs> Dragon Ball Z but still want to play this game. Uh, so, it, look, it does just replicate. Rosebud it is Rosebud is his sled. <laughs> it does just replicate the story from Dragon Ball Z. So I'm not going to yeah. go into it too much. By now, if you know it, you either love it or you hate it. There's no point in really discussing it. Though I will say, it does a pretty good job of telling the story. It, it's a. It's a function of kind of three different types of storytelling. There's like full screen cinematics that are fully rendered, fully animated. There are essentially static still images with text bubbles where a lot of the conversation happens. And then there are cinematics that kind of happen in real time. And they are the Achilles heel. Um, The stuff that's like cinematic, that stuff looks great. It's shot very well. It's framed very well. It's just like the show. And the the tech behind it looks good. 
some of the conversation cinematics, though, like they, they do the whole, oh, this guy's talking, but we're showing the back of his head or we're showing it from some weird angle where you can't tell who is talking. Like you're seeing right here. There's a perfect example of it. Like like he'll be talking, Goku will be talking to Gohan, but you won't see his face. You'll see Gohan's It's just the principles of storytelling aren't handled especially well in this game. Some parts of it are, some parts of it not so much. Um, so I think a lot of people who are watching this B-roll or maybe just watched a trailer or two, they're probably like, oh, wow, it's like Skyrim, but Dragon Ball. It's like this big open world universe where you can go wherever you want and do whatever you want. And that's simply not the case. We knew, I knew before I started playing this game that it wasn't a true open world game. I had played it at a couple, uh, conventions, press events, stuff like that. So I knew that there were, they were sections of the level that you were confined to and then there would be load times. However, now that I've actually played the game, it's not open world at all. Not even like pseudo open world. Not even like God of War pseudo open world. I mean, the the levels in this game are really no bigger than single player levels would have been in non-open world games. Um, You can literally, because you can run so fast, you can run from one end to the other in probably like 15 or 20 seconds because you run really quickly. And so you can make a lot of make a lot of headway in a short amount of time. So the, the first thing I would say is the worlds in this game are small. They're not big. And you'll get to a point and like a load screen will pop up and it'll have to load like the next section of the level. It is not an open world game or anything really close to it. Now, one thing I would say is the amount of things to do, the opportunities of things to do in this game is no less. So if you're saying like, per square virtual mile, how many mission objectives or things are there to do, it's on par with pretty much all other modern action RPGs. Uh, There's lots of activities you can take part in. There's like fishing, as you just saw. Um, There's uh, cooking in the game. Cooking's like a big part of the game. I was surprised to find out. Although I think that just, I think Japanese action (laughs) RPGs at this point, it's like a prerequisite after like Breath of the Wild. They're like, we gotta have cooking because that's what Zelda did. So cooking is like a big part of it, and like the the stuff that you cook, it gives you buffs. Some of them are temporary, some of them are permanent. Um, some of them don't do much. If you actually have your wife cook stuff for you, though, that stuff's like crazy powerful and will actually affect like your permanent uh, stats. Um, so there's the worlds are pretty full. There's also kind of a crackdown type orb collecting thing in this game, and at first I started collecting them and. I was like, okay, what do these do? Like, some of them are for just, like, health or whatever. and But, but there's, like, three or four different kinds of orbs. And I was like, what are all these doing? And I couldn't, like, figure it out because this game has a lot of systems. And some of them are buried, like, really deep in the menus. And you have to kind of know what you're looking for before you find them. And the game, even though it is absolutely bloated and overloaded with tutorials, and I am telling you, it will annoy you by how often this game tells you what you should be doing. It doesn't tell you about the stuff that's really hard to find. It's like Captain Obvious. It's like, I know that, dude. Like, I figured out how to run. I know I click the right, the left stick and I run. It, but it doesn't show you, like, how do you, like, level your character up? For the first few hours I played this game, I didn't even think there was leveling. Like, it would say, level up, but I didn't think that you actually had any control over the, the stats and which stats were, were boosted up. And eventually, like a few hours later, I was just digging around. I'm like, oh, my God, all these orbs that I've been collecting, you use those to (laughs) increase your stat. Like, I didn't even know. So the game is heavy-handed in teaching you stuff, but it doesn't spend enough time on the stuff that's hard to figure out, I guess is the best way to Mm -hmm. put it. Um, Let's see. So there's, there's racing. Like, Goku flies around on a cloud, and you have free roam to kind of fly wherever you want and a lot of the orbs that you collect are located in the sky i think you saw a little bit of that in the b-roll already um so there it does give you kind of a sense of freedom even if there really isn't even if you fly 100 yards that other direction you're going to hit like the end of the world and you're going to need a load or whatever it does do a pretty good job of giving you the illusion of freedom because you are kind of free within each one of those spheres for lack of a better word Uh, to do whatever you want and go wherever you want. And you can tackle everything in whatever order you want to. Um, The side missions, some of them do disappear eventually. So you don't have, like, you can't come back, like, when you're at hour 40 of this game. And this game is, like, 40 hours long, by the way. You can't come back at, like, hour 37 
and complete that side quest that you saw in the first two hours you were playing it. Like it will have disappeared at that point. Um, but you can decide when you're in that level and before you move on, you can do things in whatever order that you want to. Uh, combat in the game. Oh man. <laughs> it's like, it looks like the show. It doesn't feel like anything. Mm-hmm. Like there's no, you don't feel any impact when you land punches, when you fire your Kai attacks, or even when you pull off like one of your supers. Uh, well, those, those have some, some oomph. But the most time that you spend is just fired off your Kai and just smashing the melee button. Key. Key. And it, you, it, 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 it makes me feel nothing, I guess is the best way to put it. It feels like you're just mashing, like, a paper character on a TV screen. Like, yeah, just, it did not feel good when I played it. It doesn't. It just feels like you're hitting buttons and you're seeing stuff happen, but it do, you don't feel connected to what's happening on the screen. Um, the battles are fast. They're definitely different from any other action RPG I've played. I mean, battles take place like, you know, you can drive each other through, like, mountains. You can go underwater. Uh, The free form of the combat is something that definitely sets it apart from other action RPGs. It just isn't that great. And there's not much depth to it either. Basically, what you do is you, as you're closing the gap, you fire your key... Then you start laying in the melee. Once you've kind of loaded up with a combo with your melee, then you hold triangle, charge up, and release your super. And you just rinse and repeat. There's a block and a dodge mechanic for 99% of the enemies you face. You'll never have to use it. In fact, the enemies that you just run into, like, out in the world that aren't boss characters, they're a joke. Like, you just, you don't have to do anything but melee. You can just melee, 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 just button mash, and you can beat most of them. Some of the bosses you have to get crafty with a little bit later, but then they cheat. Um, There's all these weird kind of issues where moves get canceled. So if you, you almost have to learn how to work around the game because if if you go through certain a certain combo and then go to use your super, sometimes the camera will cut away and it will cancel your attack. Meanwhile. Mm -hmm the boss characters can just fire off their specials with, like, no governing at all. So there there are times where the boss fights can feel a little cheap. They're not impossible, but they can feel a little cheap. The rank-and-file enemies in this game, it's it's a joke. Like, I don't even know why they're there. Um, as far as progression, progression is the weakest part of this game. You never feel like you're becoming any more powerful because you can see... In this footage, in this B-roll, like all our B-rolls, taken from the first couple hours of the game. We try not to spoil anything for you guys. But you can see that I'm fighting some of the biggest characters in in Dragon Ball Z. And I'm beating them pretty easily without any problem. And then the, the enemies that you just run into. So, like, when you're flying, you have, like, this vision that you can use to look down on the ground. And it shows, like, important objects. It will show enemies. Um, if you use that vision, sometimes if you're close to an enemy, you'll just get randomly attacked by the enemy. And those enemies are a joke. Like, literally, you can just mash the circle button and melee them until they're done. Um, as far as, like, experience and the progression system in the game, it, it's like it doesn't even matter. Like, you do level up, and you do assign points to stuff, and you do get buffs in some stats for food that you make and food that you eat. And there's this weird, like board system community board system where once you meet someone in the game you'll get a board for that person depending on what their discipline is some are like for combat some are for cooking it all depends on what they do inside the game and then you start like dropping characters onto this board and linking them together and it will increase the power of all the characters that are linked based upon how likely they are to mesh with that original head character there's all this stuff going on and none of it matters matt Like, you don't have to do any of that crap. Like, the game, if you just play through the main quest in this game, you can just walk through the game. As far as leveling and things like that, you'll never feel like you need to go grind, which it doesn't matter because a lot of the stuff that you do, like, you'll beat, like, one story mission, and you'll get more experience than you would get if you had completed literally, I'm not exaggerating, like, 500 side missions. So the side missions are really just there as a diversion. They're there. And, like, the first one you do is, like, you're finding a porn magazine for one of the characters, which is very weird. I was like, that's, that's very in character for that character. Right. That's his thing. Yeah. Like, they were talking about it at first. And then your first side mission is go find his porn magazine. And I was like, this is a game for, like, kids. This is so weird. Um, so there are lots of side missions that you can complete, but there's just really not much reason to do them. So... I'm 
I don't know. I'm probably like 15 hours into this game at this point. Wow. I feel like I am no. Hours, you're never getting back. Well, obviously, the ultimate goal is to collect all seven Dragon Balls, mm. and I just like got to the point where I'm collecting like the first one. Like, and I <laughs> once I realized that, I was like, oh no. Even in January of 2020, with nothing else to play, there's no way I'm going to finish this game. It's just not going to happen. Now, I will say this. The source material is handled with kids' gloves. You can tell that the people who made it are huge Dragon Ball fans, and they have a ton of respect for the IP and for the characters inside it and for the fans. So if you're a fan of Dragon Ball Z, just go buy the game. It's not great. Like, I would say if I reviewed this on the old school game trailers seven-point scale, it would probably get like a six. That would be my guess. Maybe <laughs> low six, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Um which means that for fans, it's fine, and for everybody else, just stay the hell away. Mm. That's really what it comes down to. Um, I would, I would say, I feel like it, we all know this, yeah. about Dragon Ball by now. I mean, at first, I, I really hated this game. The first hour with this game, I was like, I don't think I can keep playing, but I was like, I have to, so I stuck with it. And I will say this: I did slowly start to enjoy playing the game, and I started to be a little more tolerant of Dragon Ball. (laughs) Uh, I know, it's weird. But, like, for whatever reason, the beginning of the game is really obnoxious. And then as it kind of settles in, you start to meet all the characters from the story, and you can kind of see that each one of them kind of has their own little thing going on and their own motivations. And I started to understand kind of the the family construct with Goku and Gohan Mm -hmm. and and all that stuff. And, And I started to like it a little bit more, to the point where I made it 15 hours in. But, yeah. Once I got there, I was like, okay, I've played enough of this to understand it, to be able to intelligently recommend whether people should buy it or not. And now I struggle to see myself playing playing it anymore. But if you're a Dragon Ball fan, um, this is probably the best Dragon Ball action-adventure RPG-ish game ever, I would say. Um, Fighters, probably to this day, is still the best Dragon Ball game ever made. This is probably the best action adventure ever made. The combat gets really repetitive. I feel like people who are really fans of the IP will have a lot more tolerance for that than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, And and the initial part of the game, there isn't a ton of combat in it, but eventually it starts to settle in and there is a lot. And some of the battles with some of the tough characters, they can last like 20 minutes. Like you're literally like chipping them down. And then the battles with everybody else will last like 10 seconds. So there's mm. not a really good balance between like the enemies and the AI and things like that. Um, if you're not in a single player, there's no multiplayer in this. No surprise there. Although maybe, you know, with, with uh, Xenoverse out there, you maybe thought there could be a head-to-head mode. There probably maybe should be a head-to-head mode. But as of right now, there's not. Maybe that's something that comes on as DLC down the road. I'm not sure. I haven't looked what at the weird uh, main menu. Yeah, I haven't really looked at the roadmap for the DLC in this game to know if something like that's coming. But it certainly could mm-hmm. work, um, and it would be a lot more interesting than actually fight, fight, fighting the uh, the enemies that are in this game for you to fight already. Um, Community really makes me expect it to be like some kind of connect like online feature. Nope. No, and I thought so too when I first started playing it. And it's all about those community boards. Hmm. It's like you have a character in the center. You can see right there is one of them. Mm-hmm. And then you have all those spots all around them, and you can fill those in with other characters that you unlock throughout the game. And it, depending on you know their interests and their powers, you know if, if you link up the right people, it could be a huge boost. Um, I didn't notice any changes from pretty much anything I did in this game. So if you want to talk about progression, there really is none. Like, there's a a veil of progression. They want you to believe that what you're doing matters, but it really doesn't. Uh, You can just play, you can just drive through the main story. You're always going to be powerful enough to fight because every time you complete a main story mission, they just give you gobs of experience and it just makes all those other systems pointless. Hmm. So, it's a good Dragon Ball game. It's not a particularly good video game. I guess this is the best way I would put Mm -hmm. it. Um, It is 60 bucks, so you better make sure that you love Dragon Ball before you buy this. But if you do love it, like, this may be your favorite game of 2020. Let's just be honest. I... If you're not a Dragon Ball fan, I don't even recommend, like, renting this if you're an adult. It it definitely... There were times I was playing this where I felt like if somebody saw me playing it, I'd feel a little weird. (laughs) 
Not not even because like I had to find a porn magazine in a kids game. It's just like part, certain parts of it are just very juvenile. I mean, it's Dragon mm-hmm. Ball. So yeah. I think you're right. I think we all knew that this is where this conversation was going to go when we saw the first trailer for this game. But, look, I put in the time uh, to make sure that our preconceived notions weren't just preconceived, and we were right. (laughs) The the gameplay and the systems do not transcend someone's lack of interest in Dragon Ball. That would be the closing line to my game eval. So there you go. Available for everything but Switch. I would not be surprised if it eventually comes to Switch. Um, I know when you watch the trailers for this game or you watch some of the B-roll that we just ran, you look at it, you're like, it looks just like the cartoon. It really doesn't when you play it. No. Certainly not on the level of fighters. No. No. Like, the worlds are just really barren. It's Mm -hmm. like there's nothing there but just, like, rings to fly through and, like, orbs to collect. Uh, the ground, there's hardly even any, like, foliage on the ground. It's just a flat ground texture for the most part. And, again, these areas aren't very big. Like, they should be able to create a ton of detail in these things. And I get it. You know, it is anime. It has a simple art style, and I do feel like they nail that. But even, like, the animation of some of the faces and, like, uh, facial expressions, the eyes, like, they're, it's... It's not very smooth. It's, like, very kind of jerky. Also, frame rates in this game. I played this on PS4 Pro. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, it was pretty chunky when I played it at E3 as it's well. It's bad. Like, so you, there's, you can't, like, judge it for that at the time because it's E3. But, now I can, yeah. and it's bad. So there's this one level that you're in, and there's a dragon that's just flying around the level. And if you get 30 or 40 feet away from him and sit back and watch him fly... It's like each flap is like four frames of animation. Hmm. So it gets bad. And it starts to break up here and there. So, yeah. That's it. Hmm. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Um, And I think, as you probably knew before I even started talking about this, if you're a fan, buy it. If you're not, don't even think about it. That's pretty much the way it goes. And I I hope that one day – and Fighters, I think, transcends that. Like, I enjoyed Fighters, and I don't like Dragon Ball at all. Um, But I hope someday we can find a non-fighting game – that manages to kind of pull itself up out of that. It just, mm-hmm. It's just a good game. And, hey, it's also Dragon Ball. Uh, I think everything we've got from this IP has been the reverse. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's Dragon Ball plus a video game. Yeah. It needs to be flipped. Um, and we'll see if Bandai Nekoku can get there. I'm not, I'm not positive about that. Yeah. They've been making these games a long time, and they still can't quite get there. So, Kind of, kind of like WWE. What do you, in what way? In the same as like, oh, you just keep doing these, and they just don't really get any better. Yeah. Yeah, WWE's in deep crap right now, man. Yeah. I just saw their ratings are, like, the worst they've ever been. And there's some kind of upstart wrestling league now that's, like, taken off. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I don't know how I know that. <laughs> I picked it up somewhere because <laughs> I don't watch wrestling at all. I haven't watched this since I was, like, five years old, I don't think. I used to, but... Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people did. I pick, There's I a lot of crossover there, between yeah. gaming and wrestling, for sure. It just never clicked with me after uh, the kind of the, the OG WWF stuff. Right. Like, once that all started, all those guys started going away, like King Kong mm. Bundy and all those guys, Kamala, the Ugandan, like, all that stuff. Yeah, I liked all those things. I, I was still into it through the Attitude Era, you know, through, like, the, like the beginning of the 2000s. That's where I bailed. And all that yeah. stuff. Uh, the Rock in Stone Cold Steve Austin. I remember my friends talking to me about The Rock because I did have some friends that were adults that liked wrestling yeah. and they were talking about this guy and they'd imitate him. Yeah. Like, do you smell la, 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 what The Rock is cooking? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? They're like, there's this dude on wrestling. Like, you, you just got to see him and they keep imitating him. Like, no, he's pretty, <laughs> he is, he was the Turned most. Turned out, he was very He was the most electrifying man in sports <laughs> entertainment. That is Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Yep. I saw I saw them like the only time one of the only times I've ever seen it live was was uh, in San Jose. I saw a taping of Raw in two thousand one, and The Rock came out. And this is San Jose Arena. This is where the Sharks play. This is like yeah. huge huge concerts here. And everything he comes out, his music starts, and he comes out, and people just go crazy. And he you know, <laughs> and he did the thing where he goes, finally yeah. the ro- and like. The sa- it's the loudest thing I've ever heard in a in a stadium. Yeah. Like the the they were screaming so loud you couldn't hear him or the music. It was amazing. Yeah. It took him ten minutes to say three sentences. I think we've seen it was crazy how charismatic he yes, really was. Now he really yeah, is, no doubt about it. So 
Anyway, it's time for our trailer of the week. Those of you guys who watch our stream every week, you know this is your chance to get your questions into chat for Matt and I to answer. Go at Sifted Games. It'll make it easier for us to uh, to pluck out your questions from the chat. Uh, also, if you guys have been waiting to subscribe via Twitch Prime, now's the time to do it because we can thank you guys for doing it, which is something that's really important to me, at least me personally. Uh, so put that in there. Get your questions in there. Our trailer of the week switched today. Hmm. Originally, it was going to be the trailer for the Resident Evil 3 remake that focused on Nemesis. And it was in the rundown, and it was all processed, and it was getting ready to be uploaded to the TriCaster. And then this morning, the first trailer for Godfall leaked. So yesterday, it's, we got like a snippet of it. Did you see mm -hmm. that? It was yeah. literally six seconds. Um, and we, we curated that on Sifted. And then this morning, the whole thing came out. Um, and so we're, that's what we've selected for our trailer of the week this week. Now, one thing I want to say before you watch it. This is the first PlayStation 5 game uh, that has been announced and shown. Uh, this is the first time you're really going to see it in motion. But one thing to keep in mind is that this trailer was created from a build from early last year. Um, so this isn't what the game looks like right now. Um, and my guess is that it looks a hell of a lot better than it does in this trailer. Um, and the game doesn't look bad. I'm not setting you up so you're like, oh, that looks awful. It looks great. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know that this is from an old build, and the game likely looks a lot better. Which means it's probably not It's not even on PS5 hardware at all. This is probably running just, on a PC. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But regardless, here it is, the first real gameplay trailer for Godfall. So, for those of you who don't know, Godfall is what's being called a loot slasher. So, it's like Destiny or Anthem, but it's all driven by melee. Mm -hmm. Do you think that can succeed? Uh, I don't see any reason why it couldn't. I don't know if this is the one. Yeah. But, uh, sure. If, the, if, the, if it's fun. Because I figure, like, you look at games like Destiny. Yep, predominantly you're shooting. But there is melee in there. Yeah. So, you have the option. You can both go hand-to-hand, -hand, or you can shoot. This, there is no option. It's just all melee. Mm. I don't know. I mean, it's been done. Like, plenty of games are melee. Is there a game as a service that's a melee, though? No, but I don't really see a problem with it. Like, uh, if they get it to work, great. Yeah. Like, there's nothing, nothing inherently about melee makes me think you can't adapt that, that system. It's just, you know, Borderlands with more swords. Like, yeah. it's fine. This game also, by the way, yeah. is eventually coming to PC as well. It, yeah. it appears to be a timed exclusive on PlayStation 5. Like, I don't know, like, how to feel about, I mean, it doesn't look particularly interesting to me. It doesn't. Um, it just looks like another hack and slash whatever, and then, like, layering games as a service elements on top of it does not make me more interested. Um, but at the same time, like, the story behind it where, like, uh, you know, Gearbox saw it and thought it was so good that they're like, we'll sponsor you or do whatever we need to do to get this game, you know, in front of people... Like, you know, I'm not saying Gearbox always churns out gold, but, like, uh, if they think it's something worth putting themselves out there for, I will keep an eye on it, you know? Yeah. No. I, I can't imagine it's going to be It's a most... PlayStation 5 game. I'm definitely going to keep an eye on it. I mean, I that it's not enough reason for me, because... Right now it's not? No, I don't care about... I, I, I don't care about a game launching for that nearly as much as a good one launching for that. You know, I, yeah. I don't... I bought Ready to Rumble when the Dreamcast came out. I know, so what, launch, I. I know what launch games are. You know, like, yep. 
I'm not dumb, but like uh, you know, I'm, I keep an eye on it in terms of like what things look like or what you know, uh, kind of a middle of the road game is going to look like on the new hardware. But that's obviously not it because yeah. it's, it's an ancient build, and you know who knows what it's really going to be. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, but nothing there makes me go like, oh, I really want to try this. It's not a killer app. No, that's fair to say, right? Yeah. Even now, so. we can say that's not a killer. I think so. It's it's a it's it just it helps fill the roster out. Hey, it's already better than a lot of the <laughs> release games for PlayStation oh, sure. platforms. I mean, PlayStation has not has traditionally had some pretty awful launches yes. launch lineups. So Software like, wise, already yeah. that's pretty far ahead of the game in terms of some of those Gundam games I played. Agreed. And uh, God, it's probably better than Killzone Shadowfall. Probably. Honest, right. Some people won't want to hear that, but it's the truth. All right, let's get to some questions here. Uh, first of all, let me thank everybody. Let's see. Exit Human, thank you for subscribing via Twitch Prime. Raphael Michael, thank you. I know that I saw a ton happening during the early part of the show. I'm sorry that uh, I missed them. Uh, let's get to some qual oh, Truth 316, thank you. Truth that definitely helps. Thank you, man. We appreciate it. Or woman, depending on if you're a girl or not. Uh, okay, let's get to some questions. Uh, Vincent, just rings to fly through better or worse than Superman 64? Oh, it's way better than Superman 64. Mm. Superman 64, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, this game was the worst game ever or that game was the worst game ever. And then they're usually exaggerating. Superman 64 is not an exaggeration. It no, is literally like one of their worst games ever made. Um, not even like worst game with a budget ever made. Just like worst game ever made. Um, this is not in that class at it's no, all. It's no big rigs over the road racing. No, there's another one. That is objectively one of the mm. worst games ever made absolutely and this is not in that class it's it's a decent game and i would say if you're a dragon ball fan it's a good game if that makes sense um commander fet 03 if you didn't work in video games what kind of job would you want to do well film you're kind of doing it right now yeah I'm, my, my main thing would to be out of games would be to work in film and i'm shooting two short films next month which is one of the reasons uh, I have not had a lot of time to catch up on things. You know, it is a dead month, but I haven't caught up on any of my backlog or anything just because I've been busy with those. Yeah. Um, I th I've said this before. I would work in sports for sure. I'd be a sports journalist instead of a games journalist. It's just – it was the track I was on in college. Uh, I was mm. su supposed to become a sports writer. And in my junior year of college, I realized that that was probably stupid yeah. and that I should find something to cover that everybody and their brother didn't want to cover – and I just started looking at my interests, and I was like, I love video games more than I love sports. And there weren't a whole lot of opportunities then. It was a risk. I mean, there weren't any. There were, like, two magazines at that point and, like, one website. Um, and I was just like, this is what I want to do. And my professors and my counselors at Temple told me I was insane. Um, and I did it anyway. So <laughs> I would definitely be a sports journalist in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I've even thought about, like, just starting, like, a – some sports related content because I do regret in some ways that I wasn't able to be a part of kind of that field. Um, so maybe someday Sifta gets to a point where we have like a sports channel or something and I could kind of indulge my uh, fantasies a little bit. Um, I've even thought about just doing, I have a bunch of friends who kind of work in the press in Pittsburgh. Um, one guy worked with us at game trailers. He's like one of the world's mm -hmm. like most renowned pirates journalists, Pittsburgh pirates journalists. And I've thought about doing a podcast with a couple people that I know from Pittsburgh that are really into Pittsburgh sports just for Pittsburgh sports because there aren't any. It's really weird um, that there are no podcasts for Pittsburgh sports fans. So I've thought about doing that, but that's that's down the road. That's when Sifted mm -hmm. is has turned into something else or whatever. It's not for now, but I've definitely thought about it. Uh, let's see, Eth Demon, the creator of Skies of Arcadia recently said he would like to make a sequel. Would you want a sequel or a remake of the first one? I would prefer, prefer the remake, given how old the game is. Um, I would prefer both, frankly. I'd like to bring the, the game forward onto modern systems, but I'd like to see more as well. Yeah, I, I, I'll take I can't any... imagine if you make a sequel to that, you don't remaster the first game. Yeah, yeah, It would be, yeah, exactly. Like, and then you put, like, the remaster of the first one out, out. like, a year yeah. before the sequel comes yeah. out. Uh, to me, Skies of Arcadia is one of the most missed great games of all time. Mm -hmm. As far as how good a game is and how few people have actually played yeah. it. And I always mention that one also because 
one of the reasons I don't like Final Fantasy VII in hindsight, I didn't think it was that great to begin with, but I, in hindsight is everyone started copying it, started aping it, because they thought that was the tone and the, and the style that everybody wanted because it sold so well. So you had this like kind of glut over the next several years of these these just bloated, depressing, dark... Vapid. Uh, 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 yeah, like just uh, really emo like JRPGs. Yeah. And then here comes Skies of Arcadia with like, it's bright and colorful and it takes place in the sky and the characters all are super and excited looked, to be doing what time, they're doing. And at the time, it looked gorgeous. Yeah, but like the fact that the characters were excited to do be on this adventure, because like, that was the whole thing was like, char- like protagonists that didn't want to be doing what they were doing. Yeah. And like these guys just, they want to be sky pirates and they want to sail the, the, the sky and they want, it was great. It was yeah. Like, the positivity of it and the and the adventure and the exploration of it was great. And at the time, it was easily the best looking 3D RPG ever made. Yeah, it was a Dreamcast game, and so mm-hmm. it had a leg up on everybody. And it undoubtedly the best yeah. real time RPG made. I would definitely say for a remaster, I would prefer the GameCube version because yeah. they they, they fixed smoothed the, out some they edges, fixed the random battle frequency and yeah. some other things. But like, yeah, that is a that is a game that more people should be able to play. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, Justin Horman. How big a part do you think Game Pass is of Xbox Next Gen launch plans? Do you think PlayStation Now will be nearly as big a part of PlayStation's launch strategy? I think they're the key cornerstone of their launch plans. I think Game Pass is the cornerstone of Microsoft's future. Yeah. I mean, to, I think to Microsoft, all it cares about is getting people signed up for services so that they're automatically charging your credit card every month. Mm-hmm. And it's not even all that concerned about how much is charging your credit card every month. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just having that reliable revenue. Um, that was the, I mean, I can speak from my own experience. You know, going to Patreon from our old subscription system. It changed everything because when we were on our old subscription system, we never knew how much money we were going to make. We'd have a week where a ton of people signed up and then two weeks where hardly anyone signed up. And you you couldn't rely on the money, which means you couldn't plan anything because you never knew if you were going to have money or not to be able to do it. So even with our Patreon, it's not gigantic like a lot of the other guys, but it's stable and reliable. And so I know that it's coming. I know how much is going to be there. And we can plan around that. You can actually do something with it, even though it's not very much. Um, and I think that is what Microsoft is looking for. And I think as time goes on, Sony's going to start to wise up and it's going to start to realize the same thing. Having that steady stream of money that just recurs month after month or year after year, that's where it's all going. Microsoft was way out ahead of it. I think the reason it was it's out ahead of it is because it launched Xbox Live first and it realized before anybody else, hey, it's pretty nice getting 50 or 60 bucks from every user per year for mm-hmm. just this service. And I think, you know, that was kind of one of the first big services that blew up. Then you start seeing iTunes explode. I think everyone's just learning from the successes of others at this point. And I think absolutely midway through this generation, I think you'll start to see Sony have at least as big an emphasis on PlayStation now Mm -hmm. as it does its sort of packaged products in its brick and mortar experience. So... Yeah, I think you're going to see PlayStation changing. I think right now, though, it's behind. It's not quite there yet with Microsoft as far as the importance of these services, but I think it's going to get there. Yeah. Uh, Super Corn on Blue. No question. Just wanted to say keep up the great work with the site. Shane and Matt, Alien 3 is underrated. <laughs> Underappreciated pure bliss. Alien 3 is complete trash. <laughs> it's one of the angriest I've ever been when I saw a movie. And then I rewatched it when Prometheus came out, and it's somehow worse than I remember it being. Uh, Lynn Jeff 99 Matt, or what are you doing to quit sugar? How are you feeling without it? Um, well, I, I think that's a problem all of us have. Is yeah, like, I mean, is, I'm not like super. I didn't quit sugar completely. Like, um, I still eat fruit. I still have. You that's know, glucose, though. That's gl- different. Yeah, it's, it was fructose, but like, it's added sugar. You're trying to kill. So no soda, no um, corn syrup. Corn syrup. Uh, just it's, you know, it's you want if you are getting sugar, you want it to come from something that's going to give you some other kind of nutrients. You want just, it to be natural sugar, yeah. not processed cane sugar. And I'll still, eat, you know, when I make cookies, you know, I make cookies for movie nights and stuff. Uh, you know, I'll still have a cookie because like, gotta know if it's good. Yep, um, you gotta test I, them. But I won't eat anymore. And like, you know, back in the day, I would have probably just eaten the whole rest. Of anything <laughs> anyway. Now I bring them to him, and he and his wife eat them. 
<laughs> That's much better. He has offloaded cookies on um, me like fair, three times fair, in the last often, month and a half. Yeah. yeah, and just keep them coming, man. Yeah. I have no problems with sugar. <laughs> I do and, actually, uh, but I I didn't. I'm find in it, denial. I didn't find it that difficult, really. But I don't have an addictive personality. Like I don't. I have never. Got you don't get hooked on stuff. I never got hooked on alcohol or or cigarettes or any of that stuff. I mean, sugar is probably the closest. But when you come to me and you're like, yeah, if you don't stop this, you'll probably, like, die in 15 years. I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. We're okay, uh, that's, that's all you need to tell me. <laughs> um, so I'm, yeah, so I started that in, like, August, September, and uh, I felt fine. Like, I didn't have, like, the like the keto, keto crash or anything yeah. like that. I did, it wasn't a big deal. Um, I'm just more careful about it and don't, you know, eat the whole package of Oreos. I don't eat Oreos, really, but, I, but it's like, that's, <laughs> that's the trick. It's like, the trick is, like, I was eating so much sugar that... Fixing it was just a matter of eating like an adult. Yeah, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't even like a like I have to change my eating habits forever, and I have to eat weird things forever. It's just like no, you should probably just like eat green things. Sometimes. What happens to a lot of people is like the first time they move out on their own, and they're allowed to buy whatever they want, eat whatever they want, whenever they want. A lot of people, that's a problem. There was some of that. It was also some of just like you know, we work in a high speed, high pressure environment. Most of also our, where most you of sit our on your ass a lot. Yeah, you sit around, but also like you eat whatever's available, and usually what's available is not particularly healthy. It's like so, craft food, and yeah, just so you just got to be better about that. And I mean, I'm, I'm I'm 30 pounds lighter than I was six months ago. So awesome, man! Huzzah. Keep going, bro. Uh, let's see. Do you have any more? Do, do, do. Oh, yes. Raphael Michael, what's a game you really want to see on the PlayStation 5 that has not been announced yet? Well, I mean, Spider-Man 2, God of War 2. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, Sequels. Yeah. But, uh, I, hmm. Hmm. I mean, part of it is I, I hope we get new things that we never knew might show up, and that's what the surprise Ding, ding, is. ding. Yeah. yeah. I don't want that. I don't, it's like, I, we already get enough sequels. Mm. Like, I don't want to know, I want to not know what games are coming to right. PlayStation 5. I'll tell you a weird thing I would like to see is I would like to see a Resistance remaster collection. Okay. I'd like to see them bring Resistance back. That was a trilogy. Yeah. Which is crazy to think yeah, of. There are three of those. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was a huge fan of them, but. Three of those with wildly varying tone, quality, and like, Style like it was, it was a it's a very interesting series. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people. I would point to the same some games. A lot of people with Dino Crisis. There's some yeah. some old IP from the PlayStation One era that has just kind of disappeared that I wouldn't mind seeing revived. Make me another Fantasy Star. Make me Fantasy Star Five, and we'll talk. Onimusha, stuff like that. Armored Core. Yeah, there's a few. Um, Colony Wars. Bring back Colony Wars, Sony. <laughs> the J-Bone 29 with Microsoft, Sony, and maybe Google snatching up independent studios. Do you think any of them buy ZeniMax? No. Zen no, it's too big. too big. Yeah, it's not worth it. Like, you can um, buy one of these studios generally. Like some of the indie studios you can buy for like $10 million. Yeah. And the like, big studio buy, you can buy for like 100 or the 200 The situation would be like THQ. If they folded up their game development, they wouldn't sell the company. They'd sell the IP. Yep. Individually yeah. at an auction. Yeah, some of that THQ IP sold for nothing. Yeah, like nothing, like a dollar. Darkstalkers was a, the deal of the century. It's insane. If, if, if Darkstalkers becomes a money making proposition for THQ Nordic, like that's one of the best buys of the last decade. Yeah, like they they you know I mean and also that's how uh, I believe that's also what happened with Fallout when the Interplay folded. Yeah, that's how. Yeah, I think you may be right. Actually, because it got Fallout yeah. off the scrap heap for cheap. Um, I don't even know what this means. Minority games. I'd love to answer your question, but I don't really get it. Did you play as a Super Saiyan? What does that mean? That's Dragon Ball. Did I know you, that, did but you, did what you does go it mean? Super Saiyan at any point? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you have to. Sure. <laughs> um, I have no. How are you doing, fellow kids? Yeah. <laughs> One Super Master Gamer. Thank you for subscribing. Fifteen months too, man. Thanks. Lestevid Morbius trailer thoughts. Um. <laughs> I give it credit. Is Lestevit from Interview with a Vampire? No, that's Lestat. Lestat. Okay. Uh, the uh, Morbius thing, I mean, he looks like Morbius, I guess. Um, I give it credit for being, unlike most Sony trailers, which are like, coming soon to a theater near you, the entire following plot. Uh, this trailer only gives away the first act of the movie, so that's, <laughs> that's positive. Um, it desperately wants you to think it's Marvel Cinematic Universe, yeah. but it's not, because there's like posters of... 
of Spider-Man with murderer spray painted over it, except it's the Sam Raimi Spider-Man, which yeah. is bizarre. That is weird. And then like, I think that's on purpose, though. Oh yeah. Well, no, it's on purpose because they want you to think it's part of the, the cinematic right. universe, but it, it isn't. It's yeah. just more Sony garbage, and uh, like Venom was. And uh, though Venom was fun, it was still bad. It was bad. Um, I watched it on a flight. Yeah, it's about where you should. I didn't watch regret it. watching it. No. It helped the time pass by. And uh, you know, and, and uh, Michael Keaton shows up as you know, ostensibly as the Vulture, as Adrian Toomes from Spider-Man: Homecoming. But it will not surprise me if in the final movie his name is never said, and you're just supposed to assume right. that's who it is. Yep. Um, I'm also not a fan of Jared Leto in general. Like, I don't think he's tremendously good, and he seems to be a very unpleasant person from some <laughs> of the industry gossip. But uh, uh, I don't know. Like it's it sure is a movie, and it sure is coming out. It doesn't show a lot. No, yet. Um, I don't understand why Sony thinks all these weird standalone things are going to work that way. I do think because of Venom and Joker's success, you are going to see. And Morbius is obviously not part of this because the release date's a different time. You're just going to see every first weekend of October. You're just always going to get some gritty, needless, edge lord standalone supervillain movie. Um, and that's just what the beginning of October is going to be from now on. Because yep. Venom made a billion dollars and Joker made a billion dollars. And then clearly it doesn't matter whether the movie's any good. And then Joker also has the most uh, Oscar nominations this year, which is weird because it's the lowest rated movie nominated for Best Picture. But it has it has the least praise and the most nominations. Interesting. It's got like a 68 or something on Metacritic. All right. One last question from One Sleeper Master Gamer. What movies are you looking forward to in 2020? Um... God, I haven't even thought about that. I'm looking forward to getting my own movie done. How about that? Well, there aren't a lot of big, like, films no, where the, you've been, like, waiting for, all like... All the big ones, big stuff ended last it year. It did. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Black Widow uh, and uh, Wonder Woman. Um, yeah, I just saw the first trailer for that last night. Yeah, Wonder Woman looks Set good. in the 80s, it looks like. Yes, Wonder Woman 84. Set in 84, which is going to be fun, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't care about The Eternals, uh, which is the November um, Marvel movie, but... Uh, I, if they feel they have an Eternals story to tell, I trust them at this point. Uh, and I would probably just see it just to see Kumail Nanjiani uh, ripped like he was in that photo he put up recently. Yeah, like yeah. That was, that's very impressive to me. As I know, as someone who's working towards that goal. Well, no, I'm just tangentially <laughs> having known him and right. his wife, I'm just like, wow, yeah. I can't believe that happened. Like, that's what happens when you get a fit with a trainer. Well, that's what he said. He's shoving uh, the right food down your his, throat. On his Instagram thing, he promised his wife that he'll be interesting again one day. <laughs> that's all he's done for like a year. That's funny. Um, yeah, I'm, t- I'm trying to think. Like, I haven't like really. There aren't a lot of big films that are like pegged for 2020. Yeah, uh, Fast and Furious Nine. That's, <laughs> that, that's that's my trash. That's a good that. time waster for sure. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't thought about it too much really. Okay, I'll get to it. All right, that's it for Game Face One Ninety Six again. Oh, a- Tenet, good one. Case Money, Tenet. Oh. New Christopher Nolan movie. That's, oh, okay. that's also on my on my list. Okay. A reminder: the Sifted Fantasy Challenge for twenty twenty is live right now. There is an article pinned to the top of all your sifts at sifted.net that will point you to the website where you need to go and make your picks. There's rules in the article. There's rules on the page once you get there. You should all figure it out. Again, um, you need to register for Sifted before you make your picks. I don't want to I don't want, I'll repeat it again. Before you make your picks, make sure you register if you're not already registered on Sifted. Uh, the other thing too is if you want to get the full prizes, you need to be a patron or a subscriber to Sifted throughout the year. Uh, Patrons or subscribers will get two games as a winner. If you're a winner and you're not a patron or subscriber, you'll get one game. Either way, you're going to win something for having a ton of fun. So that's it for us. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, I am at Dinfire. Matt is at M. Kyle. If you'd like to help us out financially, which we'd really appreciate and we need it, our Patreon right now is at, like its rock bottom amount. Um, you can help us out at patreon.com slash sifted. You can give us as much or as little as you want per month there. Even a dollar a month makes a difference for us. Every dollar makes a difference for us, unlike some other Patreons uh, where they just have so much money they don't even know what to do with it. Every dollar matters for us, and we'd really appreciate it. Also, you can help us out with Twitch Prime. Folks on YouTube, we'd really appreciate it. If, if all the people who watch our show on YouTube just helped us with, with Twitch Prime, we'd be golden. That's it. It's mm-hmm. so simple. And if you're watching three hours a week of our show, you can't take five seconds to subscribe on Twitch Prime. I can't understand it, but that's the world we live in. So if you could do that, it would help us a lot. We'd really appreciate it. Um, Don't forget the deadline to submit your picks for the Fantasy Challenge is next week. So when we come back here for Game Face next Tuesday, 
uh, by the end of that day, and we will remind you again next week, but by the end of day that day will be the cutoff for you to get your picks in. So on behalf of Matt, the crew in the shower, and myself, everyone have a great day. Game face is up and out. <laughs>